Good evening. I'd like to call to order this Tuesday, October 30th, regular meeting of the Princeton Board of Education. Welcome to this public meeting of the Princeton Board of Education. The board is an elected, unpaid group of 10 citizens who set policy and make decisions on educational, financial, and personnel matters for the Princeton Public Schools on behalf of all residents. We're always pleased when members of the community attend our meetings. The board and the school district operate under applicable New Jersey laws and under regulations of the New Jersey State Board of Education. Each meeting includes an opportunity for those attending to comment on items on the published agenda or on other matters of interest to them. And as you may know, if you'd like to speak on um, the public comment session, there's a clipboard outside. You can sign up um, just so we can manage the time effectively. The board re reserves the right to limit time allotted to public participation and law limits discussion of individual personnel and confidential matters. We hope that our meetings provide useful opportunities for communication between the board and the community, so thank you for attending. And with that, Ms. Kennedy, will you take the roll? Patrick Sullivan. Here. Betsy Baglio. Here. Beth Barron. Here. Debbie Bronfeld. Here. Jess Deutsch. Here. Bill Hare. Here. Daphne Kendall. Here. Greg Stenkowitz. Here. Michelle Tuckponder. Present. Evelyn Spahn. Here. Sam Harshbarger. Here. Allie Rounds. Absent. Thank you. Okay, that brings us to item D, the adoption of the of minutes. Uh, D1 is the uh, minutes of September 25th, 2018. Can I have a motion for that? Debbie in a second. Uh, Bill, any questions or comments on those minutes? And we're going to do this as a roll call, correct? Oh, sorry, online voting. You were here. here yeah. That was when we. Ready? Do we help you? No, I'm not seeing it. Did you get it? 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 Okay, then we're on to D2, which is the minutes for the special meeting on October 9th. Uh, can I have a motion for those minutes? Jess in a second. Betsy? Yes.
Okay, and with that, we move on to uh, the uh, board president's report, um, which is item E. E1. So I'd just like to say a couple of things. Thank you for attending tonight. I will keep this very short. Um, but we all know that we spent a lot of time over the last year working on matters associated with the referendum. And we've come to a conclusion on that for now anyway, until the, the ref referendum actually occurs. But I just wanted to highlight a little bit of the other work that's been going on all this time that maybe gets lost in the shuffle as we focus on as we focused on one issue almost to the exclusion of everything else. And really the, the I wanted to point out the hard work that our, our administrators do every day and have been doing all through this, this time. Um, we talked last time, and we'll talk a little bit this time, about the refunding of the, uh, of the bonds um, of, from July of 20, 2009. The debt service savings on this refunding is 524000 $524, over a half million dollars. Um, so that is the good work of our business administrator, Stephanie Kennedy, getting that done. Um, as I said, no controversy about that, no, not a lot of public comments about that, but a half a million dollars saved is nothing to overlook, right? Um, and at the same time, on October 18th, Moody's Investor Service came out with a um, reaffirmation of uh, Princeton's bond rating of AAA, which is the highest bond rating for municipal bonds. Um, and they focused on a couple of things um, that are strengths in our district, one being conservative budgeting practices, meaning fiscal responsibility, um, and uh, good management both at the board level and the business office. Um, and we've heard a lot of negative comments over the last year, and I think if Moody's Investor Service went up and gave public <laughs> comments, they'd say nice things about us. Um, so I'd like to thank all the people who work so hard to maintain a AAA rating. That keeps everyone's debt service costs low in this town, and it's very, very valuable to have good people who do that kind of work. Um, so th that kind of thing is happening all the time. You're going to hear tonight about some of our summer programs and science. Again, there's great work happening through this district um, that I wish more people came out and said nice things about um, because it really does deserve um, <coughs> our, our appreciation and our thanks for everything that people do. Um, and with that, I think um, there's a, uh, um, well, item E2, um, which just that we approve the formalization of the equity committee, and that is a, just a regular, regular vote. vote. Okay. First and second, first. Oh, sure. Betsy and Daphne, you want to say anything about um, that? Sure, I'd just like to say on October 4th, when equity met, the, the um, membership of the group, the board members, voted unanimously to request to the president of the board that this move from an ad hoc committee to a permanent committee. So, um, that is what we're about to vote on. And again, the work of equity is the work of every single committee and every single person in our district. But the equity committee provides a consistent place to have those conversations um, as well. So that was the thinking. Great. Our question is, Michelle. Um, I'm delighted to hear that this is going to be a permanent committee, and I agree that it is the work of every single committee and every single person to make sure that we um, try to achieve equity in our educational um, aspirations in this district. My question is, what's the specific committee charge? So this year, since it was a new committee, actually we wrote goals, a mission statement and goals for the, for the committee, which I can read. I can pull that up from my computer. The idea of that, though, for this year was um, looking at it sort of through a financial equity lens to identify barriers to access to achievement um, and, and brainstorm opportunities, you know, to, to um, meet those needs of all students. We know that equity, that, that economic equity or whatever term we want to use for that, that is only one of the lenses through which we'll look at this work. And so that is part of the reasoning why this would be, this is not really an ad hoc committee. This is not one year's worth of work. This is, there will be years ahead to look at this. Um, so I can, maybe during the equity report, I'll pull that up and read to you what the mission and goals were that we decided on for the year, but I think they'll change. Thank you. Sure. If you can find it, yeah, yeah, because I think the 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 hope is that we continue to focus on systems, um, and whether it's transportation, 
economic okay. curriculum. So for the goals, um, first on our agenda, we have a quote from Steve in July of 2018. The work we are doing to achieve educational equity is essential to our mission as a school district. It is work focused on ensuring that all students, regardless of race, religion, gender, sexual identification, country of origin, cultural affiliation, language spoken, learning difference, or economic background are celebrated in our schools and achieve their highest potential. So the equity committee goals, it is our intent that the work of the equity committee will lead to the following outcomes. The identification of barriers to the participation and achievement of all students, and articulation of solutions that will improve access to opportunities for all students. Clear and consistent communication protocols to identify families of, of opportunities, as well as an articulation of procedures to be followed by each school when a particular need is identified, and the approval of requests for disbursement from the district's equity fund and clarification of other district policies or practices as needed. So then it says the committee will focus on economic equity during the first year, but will expand and continue its work in future years as this dialogue is critical to our success as a school district. Yeah, so I also think it's great, and I'm, I'm really excited about the work that you're doing. I think as a matter of process, it would be really helpful if we had that on our website and that we had it somewhere for all the committees so that the public knows yeah. what the committees are doing. And so if people, right. members of the yeah. public have an issue, they can then direct it to That's the right great. place. That's a great idea. So I'd, I'd love to see that. And actually, because this was a new committee, the four of us had to come up with this this year, right? We had to come up with a charge. But I think, yes, going forward, every committee, when it's reconstituted, nice should, yeah. should consider that. Yeah, that's a great idea. Well, I'm just proud of you for doing that, and I appreciate what you've done because I think it shows how this board, over over time, has become more proactive with a lot of with respect to a lot of things. But that's one, um, rather than reactive to the things that happen and trying to deal with them in a piecemeal way, to think about broadly where we want to go as a district. I just hope that someday you'll be able to disband the committee. Right. <laughs> um, so hopefully you can yep. work towards that. So. But, and I also want to thank the administrators for Steve, Stephanie, and Annie in particular. This is another meeting to add to their months, you know, and so it's not just the four board members, Jess and Beth and Daphne and myself, but it's the administrators who are willing to do the work. So I appreciate that. And all the countless staff members who've come as well. Did I say? I'm sorry. I looked at you, Bill. I said, Jess, Bill, and Daphne. I'm sorry. Exactly. We appreciate you, Beth, but yes, Bill, you are interesting. Okay. Is the vote, uh, any other comments before we move on? Is the vote already tallied? It's, no. Okay. It's in process. In Okay, and now we move to item F, which is the superintendent's report. Okay. Thank you. Good evening and welcome, everyone. Um, in a moment, I'm going to be introducing uh, our science supervisor, Dr. Eddie Cohen, and he is here tonight to talk about our summer science enrichment camps and also about his pilot this year of um, flexible and adaptable furniture to improve student learning. But um, before I do that, I... I just wanted to ask us all to, to pause and um, reflect for just a moment on the tragic and violent events um, that have occurred nationally over the past week. Um, they were events that I think we all see were rooted in hate and bias, and as a public school, uh, I think we need to acknowledge them and, and learn from them. Um, so as I, I'm sure everyone knows, this past Wednesday um, in Louisville, Kentucky, a man tried to enter a predominantly African-American church um, where people were worshiping in the evening. He found the door locked and um, moved on to a, a local grocery store where he, he shot and killed um, uh, a black man and a black woman. Um, and then on Saturday morning in Pittsburgh, uh, another man, a white nationalist, entered the Tree of Life Synagogue where people were peacefully gathered uh, for um, a naming ceremony marking the beginning of a, of a um, baby's journey in the Jewish faith. He shot and killed 11 people and injured six more in what um, some were calling the most violent anti-Semitic act in, on American soil. Um, and then in between those two violent events, we had um, pipe bombs delivered to um, 
current and former political leaders and members of the press, ostensibly to, uh, to silence their views um, forever. So I know that all of us mourn the loss of life and our, our hearts go out to um, the family and friends of the victims of these events. And it seems clear to, to me that we are living in a climate of increasing um, hate and violence. Um, in the past year, racist and anti-Semitic um, incidents have um, gone up 50% at schools and college campuses across the country. And so what does that mean for us as, as a school district? I think that's an, an important question to consider. So public schools have long been seen as having this foundational mission of um, preparing young people to be active citizens. But I believe that that's no longer enough. Um, I think we need to elevate that mission. Um, we need to prepare them not only to be active citizens, but also <coughs> compassionate, caring, and courageous citizens. We need young people to enter the world able to celebrate different faiths and cultures. We need young people able to stand up to injustice when they see it, whether that's in their classrooms, in their community, or in their country. Some of those young people um, here in Princeton just returned from their eighth grade trip to Washington, D.C. Um, it was a trip that we take every year. It's designed to bring to life the, the civics curriculum that the students are studying in eighth grade. Every one of those students visited the African American Museum. Every one of those students visited the Holocaust Museum. Every one of them visited the news museum focused on um, First Amendment rights. And in their eyes of um, their principal, uh, Mr. Jason Burr, it was the best trip ever to Washington, D.C. Um, yesterday I asked him why. And his answer, his answer gave me hope. And he said simply, the kids were consistently kind. He said that they, um, they offered thank yous unprompted to their bus drivers and to the people at the hotel. Um, they shared clothes with a classmate who had forgotten um, a coat. And those are the kinds of things above and beyond um, the academic learning that goes on in our classrooms that we want to see in, in our kids. Um, we talk all the time in the elementary schools about preparing them to be upstanders. Martin Luther King Jr. had said that the true goal of education is intelligence plus character. And I just want to make sure that that continues to be the focus for those of us here in the Princeton Public Schools. Um, so with that, um, Dr. Cohen, if you would like to uh, present briefly on um, the summer science enrichment camps, <laughs> and then follow that up with some uh, the, the furniture pilot, which we're all excited to see, um, that would be great. Welcome. Okay. About last year, but I'll give you a quick overview. Am I good? Can you hear me? We're good. Um, so how do you measure success? Over the two years, we thought about how do you measure success? So this is a, a student. Um, hey, I was just checking out the tomatoes, looking great, still doing football, but still into biology. So this is a student who came after the program this summer. He stopped by. We had tomatoes growing in a little vertical garden system. And on his own, he got into the classroom, checked on them, and left a little note for the teacher. You know, that makes all the work that she did this summer, she said, worthwhile. Um, when he says, I'm in the football, it's a larger freshman boy, very quiet, didn't really talk much. He had his first pickle with us this summer. Um, so there's a lot of firsts he had this summer <laughs> um, as a student. So we think about success, I just want you to think in your head about, you know, how do we measure success and what does it look like? So I'm going to go back to year one. Just so you have a little background. Is this one? So this is a glider. Um, we went to Rutgers two years ago. We took 15 middle school kids, uh, kids entering seventh grade, eighth grade, and freshmen. We had two freshmen. The original goal was to get all incoming freshmen. Uh, with only two, we decided to expand out, which is important in the future. Um, so we had 15 kids. We got to Rutgers. This glider is a $100,000 device. The Rutgers has 26, the US military has over 500 right now. Um, the idea is that it goes around the world and it gets data from around the world. You may remember that there was an issue with uh, China taking a glider out of the ocean a couple years ago. It was one of those, that's what it was. Um, so the kids were working on this technology at Rutgers this summer, or two summers ago. Um, here's a student coding. 
actually talking on a computer. You know, a girl's behind him videotaping him coding. He's actually talking through a satellite to the glider. Um, we actually had the glider outside and we put someone's cell phone number in and we sent a text message to the person. Um, you know, 100,000 other device, kids are getting to touch it, move it. The whole idea is that this device is used to uh, study the ocean and the kids actually were able to then go on a boat the second week. Um, some of them have never been on a boat before. You know, we're talking about kids who, some kids were on a rowboat. <laughs> you know, a uh, high-end research vessel, Coast Guard certified vessel, took 20 people out. Daphna joined us that day. Very brave of her. Uh, the seas were nice, so it was good. Um, but the kids were out year one doing an experience that they never, some of them have never done before. Um, so that's year one, that's 15 kids. The second part of year one was a uh, chemistry cohort at the high school level. Uh, so Dr. Carell, who's here tonight, and I talked about how we had a group of students who were looking at equity when I first got here. Um, our goal was to increase the equity and diversity in our highest level classes. Um, chemistry had a low diversity equity grouping um, that first year, so we looked at that as our target. Um, we also had kids who went to other schools in the summertime to advance. So we took a combination of kids who went to other schools to advance, brought them back in district, charged them 25% or more or less um, to educate them in our district. Plus we created a scholarship program for five students um, that first year to experience a summer uh, chemistry course five weeks. So that was year one chemistry course and middle school oceanography course. So year two, we learned from year one, and we realized that we needed some support for kids. So if you look at the girls in this picture, uh, there's 10 female students who are in an after school club. So we realized just doing the summer wasn't enough. So we wanted to do some after school clubs and support children throughout the school year and not just the summertime. So our first cohort of high school happened to be all girls. Um, and you can see they're dressed as superheroes in this picture. Um, so the club's called Spectrum. It's actually really cool because research is showing that having scientists be um, superheroes, and there's a connection between you know, comics, superheroes, and scientists. Like someone who studies electricity might turn into shooting bolts, um, and that is a, now a scientist who has become a comic. Um, so they're actually at Riverside teaching uh, fifth graders some science. So over the school year, we support them with different activities. Um, go to the next slide. Oops, let me go back one sec. Um, some different activities and we supported them. Um, we had a field trip, which I'll tell you a little bit more about in a second. So after the first summer, we created two cohorts, uh, one at the high school, one at the middle school level to support kids through careers, um, study habits, but a lot more than study habits, more of a STEM type focus. And Joy Barnes Johnson, who's in the center right there, let me see if my laser works, there she is. Um, and Jacques Bazil worked with kids at the middle school level. So now we have two parts. We have a summer program and then we initiated a after school support group. Um, this is year two summer program. And the kids don't look very happy, it just downpoured us. Um, we're in a field in North Jersey at a native garden. So for year two, year one we went on the boat, we did research um, with the oceanography. Year two, we wanted to do something different. Our goal is to have science that's really exciting, engaging, and not something they normally learn in class. So we looked at native plant, which we do teach in class, but looking at native plants and edible plants and how to use the environment to help with health. Uh, we went to the Princeton on Thursdays, they have the farm market, went to the farm market, that's when Thomas had his first pickle. Um, one of the girls never had a radish before. You know, it's just different experiences that you expect, you know, kids might have that you're given the first time. Um, this is a native garden in North Jersey. This farmer who's on the picture, she took the picture for us, um, grows native plants that you plant at your house, you use less water, you use less fertilizer. Uh, some of them have been around for hundreds of years that Native Americans have used for different ailments. Uh, the kids were funny. They said, well, everything seems to help your stomach. She said, yeah, because everything, you know, you're ingesting all these native plants, most of them do help your stomach. Um, they learn about different plants that, you know, might support uh, cancer, um, other plants that support, uh, let's see, what was one of their favorites? There was a, uh, one that makes you puke. So if you take a small, amount of it, it really helps your stomach, but if you take a little bit too much, you puke from it. So they were really excited how Native Americans discovered like, what's the right amount? <laughs> um, 
So it's really that kind of passed down from cultural, um, local indigenous folks having all these plants, then, you know, today's day and age using the same plants that might be better than some pharmaceutical options or in conjunction with pharmaceutical options. So that was year two for the summer program. And also year two, we had our uh, chemistry class again. Um, this is another picture. This is at someone's house. You see Felicia there. So I want to thank Princeton Children's Fund um, for supporting us recruiting kids. And that's Jackie Katz here, who's right now is presenting at MIT Princeton Club, so she can join us. So she ran the class. Kids were taking notes, um, learning more about native plants. I'll go back for a sec. So one part was our middle school cohort. Now these are all freshman students. They're not all in the picture right there. Um, so year one, remember, we only got two freshmen. Year two, we were able to recruit four freshmen, um, and then we opened it up last minute to get a few more kids. We actually had six kids in the program, but four freshmen, which is important because that was our original target. Um, but the other cool part was for year two, now we started this work, you know, Hun said, hey, wait a second, you're taking some of our kids for chemistry. You know, we don't want you to take all of our kids for your summer programs. You know, we're going to provide some services for you. So we had two students who signed up for their chemistry class um, who were both African-American female, they're twin students, and they really didn't need summer chemistry. They really needed math support. So I worked with Hun, and Hun said, hey, you know, we'll provide them full scholarship for math support. So then... We supported five kids our first year with the high school program. Year two now, we have three kids in our high school program, two kids on scholarship. Two more kids are now going to hunt on scholarship. Plus, here's the next picture. Um, these are kids at Princeton University doing material science, which is four more students on full rides uh, getting summer support. So for year one, we had a high school chemistry class and we had a middle school oceanography class. Year two, because the word got out, kids are getting excited. We're making partnerships around the community. Hun's taking two kids um, and supporting them in math, which we weren't supporting them before. Princeton University is taking kids who are high school kids. Um, one of the students actually who did the year two program was on the boat with us year one. So now we support a female student, um, African American, for two years. And they had a free material science, and I want to thank Dan Steinberg from Princeton University and Joy Barnes Johnson, who worked in the summer with them. So we doubled the amount of kids we're supporting in three different experiences, um, which is really exciting. So we talk about, now we don't just have a summer program, we have our program for during the school year. So five parts, STEAM career and activities, um, off-campus STEAM related field trips, so last year, we went to uh, NRG, which I'll show you a picture in a second. Um, Steve mentorship, working with different educators to support students, uh, guest st speakers and STEAM job professionals, and connection to the classroom. So this five-part experience is what our goal is for our summer program in conjunction with our after-school program to support kids all year long. Oops, let me go back. Um, any questions before I move on to the furniture piece? So we doubled the amount of kids we support at the high school level. At the middle school level, we doubled the amount of incoming freshmen we wanted to support. Um, the other cool thing was all of the incoming freshmen that took the course through the work in the summer, we actually recommended them for the next level or higher level course. Um, so 75% of the kids actually went to the higher level course or in a higher level course right now than they would have been now that they have the confidence. So that's the first two years of our equity work in the science department. Um, and we keep building and expanding and modifying and changing. Some things we learned from the first year and second year is that we need to recruit sooner. So I actually recruited sooner the second year. I got less kids, um, which is funny. So <laughs> hopefully we're going to recruit around J January this year um, to have students. We're working with grants with Valerie to try to get grants to fund all of this. The first year, the middle school program was funded by Princeton Children Area Fund. Is that correct? Foundation. Foundation. Um, Princeton Area Community Foundation funded our middle school program the first year. The second year, the tuition paid for the chemistry students. And because we had less scholarships we provided for kids because we had Princeton University and Hunt working with us, that then funded our middle school program the second year. And third year, we're still looking for funding. So when you say you're recruiting students, what are you looking for? So I'll talk about the second year recruiting. Um, so we had for... What are you going to look for in January? 
Well, that's a good question. Um, so I'll say what we looked for last year, and then we'll probably do the same thing in January. So we're looking at students who are excited and interested. So we asked all the teachers of the middle school, so I want to thank them. All the middle school teachers helped us recruit um, students and the freshman teachers and the sophomore level teachers. So we asked the teachers, you know, who do you think would actually enjoy working with in the summertime? Um, we looked at our underrepresented groups, so our Hispanic, our black, our mixed um, students based on the computer system. We pulled those names. We also looked at um, special ed population and we looked at you know, any kid that might also benefit from a program or might enjoy a program. So that was kind of our net. We actually had 82 kids, I think it was, who based on that kind of description were eighth graders that came to the JW cafeteria and Jack and I went over and presented some of the stuff we we're gonna do. So the funny part is that at 82 kids, we had less kids <laughs> for year two than we had for year one. Yep. Did we ever talk to their parents? So that was one of the things we talked about at the equity ad hoc committee is how to get the parents more involved. Um, so year one, we sent home uh, letters to all the kids that were interested. In year two, we did the same thing. So we actually had a parent who called and said, I don't know if this is right for my kids. So we, we do have those conversations, but it's based on giving up, and I used to be a middle school admin, giving a, <laughs> a middle school child with a piece of paper, having them go home, that paper gets to a parent, and then it gets back to you. So that cycle isn't the best cycle, so how do we recruit better? Um, we're doing it through classes, we're doing it through teachers, uh, we're using the digital tools that we have. Um, Joy Barnes Johnson invited myself and Annie to the Black Affinity Group, which was, was that November? No, it was a little bit later, uh, maybe in the springtime. Um, so we were talking at, with those parents at that group, and that's how we recruited the two freshman twin girls. Um, and that, having that conversation, that face-to-face -face with the mom saying, you know, my girls will do something this summer. <laughs> they could do chemistry, but they probably could use some math, and knowing that we can support them through Hun helping us. Um, and Hun offered for next school year to give us more scholarships. Um, and they're doing a more formal process. Because one of the interesting th and things is both Prince and Hun don't have access to our data. So they had a good point. You know, we don't know when kids come to us, like what they qualify, what they don't qualify for. So us working with them and talking about kids and who makes the most sense for the clubs, having that partnership, is something we're trying to grow more for year three. Yep. Can you break that down for me? Instead of being in um, one level science or another, what can you tell me? So for freshmen, we only have two levels. Um, technically, we have a, a accelerated and a biology level. So four of the kids, I want to say three of the kids, move from regular to accelerated. Mm -hmm. One girl was already going to be an accelerated anyway, but she wanted some more support this summer. And one of the boys who was a, a resource special ed student, mm -hmm. um, was suggested to go into the ICRP section. He actually didn't make that move yet, but it's still a possible move. So all of them kind of move those directions. Because we realize that if the kids aren't in those higher levels, like the earlier we can get them supported into those higher levels, the higher they'll go. So let me answer that question with the one girl I didn't actually mention very well. Um, so the one girl who was on the boat with us, we had two freshmen that first year. One of the female students was on the boat with us. Her second year, she was at the university doing material science. She emailed me the day before school started and said, can I join the research class? Research class is already overfilled. Um, I emailed all the teachers. I'm like, hey. I was like, this girl emailed. We know her background. Three out of four of the teachers emailed back within 20 minutes which is impressive. All three said, I will support her, let's override the numbers, let's get her in class. Um, so that student is sharing out with her peers some of the stuff she did. Part of the mentoring we did is why it's six to 12, is having those high school kids go down and work with the middle school kids and share some experiences. Um, so Jacques is meeting with the kids in the morning after school this year, and Joy is meeting with the kids after school. So having times when they can kind of share their ideas and share what they're doing is part of the plan, so yes. And I didn't have a picture, I thought I had a picture, I might have it later, of NRG. So all the kids went together on the field trip to NRG. Um, they did a full day field trip, a half day field trip for the middle school kids, full day for the high school kids, because they presented to the Riverside first, um, and they were all working together, sharing their ideas there too. I'm gonna do the second part real quick. So the pilot we're working on is furniture. So on the right side, some of you might know, 
No, I like my later, my laser. Um, so Heidi Hayes Jacobs is our uh, PD presenter who's a guru in education. Um, I tell my friends that, you know, why is Princeton special? You know, we have Heidi Hayes Jacobs speaking to our high school. She presents to thousand educators at conferences. So having her here, having her in our classroom, she helped write a grant. We didn't get the grant, but she helped write the grant um, for this classroom. So this is uh, Active Learning Space. Heidi Hayes Jacobs' new book is Bold Moves. I was lucky enough to go to New York with some of the other administrators and educators to see her for five sessions in New York last year about how to change facilities, how to change classrooms to meet the needs of students better. You know, our teachers are working around the classrooms as opposed to having the classroom facilitate learning. Um, so that's some of the work. So we wrote a grant for $70,000 to get a brand new classroom. We didn't get it. Um, but the good part was once you write the grant, you're in the queue, you're in the system, they know you, they send you an email like, hey, you know, we'll give you a discount, we'll, we'll work with you. So we got this furniture for a third off, um, which is still pretty good. Uh, I want to thank the PEF who gave us half the cost for the furniture and the PTO at the high school who gave us some money for the furniture. Because um, without them, there'd be no furniture. The kids would be sitting on the old lab stools. Um, so I'll show you real quick, just this one picture. So there's four different things in this room right now. We got a variety knowing the referendum's coming up, thinking about some options so people can you know, get some feedback. So we have these green chairs, um, the blue ones. The blue ones have a base on them. Both of them have tables that move. Um, these are tables with orange chairs and the back, which we'll show you again, are higher tables. The cool thing now is, as opposed to having tiered flooring, they do tiered tables. So all these tables go up in different levels, all of the chairs go up in different levels. Um, so if you actually, it's hard to tell, but there's three different heights right here. There's, this is the highest height. These are high lab benches, uh, chairs. This is a middle height, and these are a little bit lower. So if you want to sit kids this way, which we don't, because we were, we're not lecturing as much as we want to, or we don't want to lecture much, I guess I should say. Um, you could have three different levels. So that's one option for seating. Uh, these are also like really nice dry erase boards that attach to the table. You can put them in between the table too. Uh, kids can share their ideas. That kids really love those. So that's the first one. Uh, put your book bag, keep stuff off the floor. Um, so we have some qualitative results. We just have the classroom for a couple weeks now. Part of the grant, we didn't get, but we still have the, we're working with them, is pre-post test data. Um, so all of the kids in the research class, and the research class is the primary user of this room right now. Um, they did a, a survey, anonymous survey. They'll do another survey at the end, but I do have some data I can share with you. Um, right now, this is actually the teachers doing a PD in here. If you look, this room is now split into two mini classrooms. There's a teacher actually teaching her peers with these people looking towards this wall. And all of these people in the front little U or looking at the front projector. So right now, if you're in an ICRP setting, you have two teachers teaching, you can split the room. Um, we can fit 36 chairs in here easily. So the room's much bigger now. One of the cool things is now I have teachers coming to me and say, hey, you know, can we co-teach next year? Um, environmental science, the two teachers are talking about co-teaching. We have a few different groups in there. We have from sophomores to seniors, different math backgrounds, different kind of prior knowledge going into that class. So having two teachers, larger class, 40 kids, two teachers grouping, you know, it's gonna be really good for education. So having that room, the facility, actually made those two teachers come to me and say, hey, can we teach together? Um, so students and teachers are reporting that they feel it's easier to move between groups. Um, they're rolling around pretty easily, you know, like the teachers and the kids the first day, they rolled a little bit too much. They got it out of their system and now they're fine. Um, the teachers are like, oh, the kids are rolling on. Like the first day we got it, you were rolling in the hallway. Um, so it's, everyone's, you know, pretty comfortable now. Uh, better communication, people are chatting more. Uh, people are kind of moving next to each other. They're finding, saying it's easier to circulate, easier to get around, to, and that way you're getting more feedback because you're talking more, you're circulating more, the more feedback's just natural. Um, the teachers are reporting there's quicker transi transitions during periods. So when we look at um, Danielson and how people are teaching, the transition we really worry about, losing instructional time, they're saying that you can quickly move between uh, lessons and small group, whole group instruction, individual peer group uh, is pretty easy. And they appreciate the ergonomics. Um, some kids are standing. If you look back here, there's actually a teacher um, standing at the table right there because of the high heights. So you actually stand at all these tables. So kids are switching between the spots. Um, here's the research students working. So it's kind of interesting. 
these girls pulled over these individual seats to kind of work with these two pairs here. These kids are working here. This one's working individually. He's in the corner working individually. So the students are really choosing how they work, who they work with. And that's part of the reason why the research class is in there. We have three teachers teaching the research class um, with two, three cohorts all at the same time period. So our research class has sophomores, juniors, and seniors all together. Um, so the room facilitates that learning. And you can start seeing some tanks on the side right now. So they're doing a lot of, uh, a lot of research in the class right now. Um, I think I have one more slide. So this is Anna. Um, so I put this picture up because I asked the teacher, I was like, why is, how did that happen? Because if you remember from slides before, this is my teacher PD, and this is the room. The teachers in the back were using this separate area. And then the teacher sends me this picture. I'm like, so Anna put an individual chair there, which wasn't there before, moved it around the projector, put it in between the tables and kind of squared herself off from the rest of the class. And she's like, yeah, and I wanted her own little box to work. Um, so I think thinking about, when I was talking about furniture, that was one of the, we have 15 different designs for this room. <laughs> that wasn't one of them. Uh, so having students, you know, create space, work in space that they want to work in, uh, the it's easy to facilitate that with the furniture, with the flexibility of the space. Um, so I kind of want to end on that note that we're talking about, you know, how does space affect education? Students are making the choices, they're able to make the choices, they're working individually, working in groups, they're working in uh, small groups, they're creating their own groups, teachers are facilitating, we have co-teaching going on, we have multiple vantage points. We think about um, accommodations where it's like, you know, students should be at the front of the room. There isn't a front of the room now. It's multiple areas that kids are moving pretty efficiently throughout the day. Questions about furniture? You okay. No. Right. Thank you. No, Wait, Eddie, thank okay. you. Go ahead. Okay. No, I just want to thank you for all the summer stuff you've done. It's really exciting. It's grown. And I know, um, I know the students, because I know Dr. Carell mentioned students came to him and just said they felt more comfortable in the classes. So it's really, really wonderful. And I wish you luck with all the rest of it happening. Right. Thank so thanks. You. Thank you. I echo my thanks as well. Um, the smile that was biggest in those pictures was yours. <laughs> you're very excited. You know, you're very enthusiastic about this work, and we can tell. Um, and I also want to thank the partnerships that you mentioned. So you've, you've already thanked them, but for example, the Hunt School and Princeton University and the groups that have made it possible to do this work. Um, we, we know we need the help to do this work. So thank you for facilitating, and thank you to them for helping. And I, I would just like to add, having tried out the furniture myself and rolled all around, um, <laughs> And I would like one of those chairs um, for the board meetings. But um, it, it's really great. And it's great that you got someone else to pay for most of it. So thank you for that. Thank you. <laughs> but I think it's also important, uh, Eddie, that you did that little experiment. I mean, we had a lot of questions about, oh, you know, this is the 1970s all over again. And you're just, you don't know what you're doing here. And so having evidence that we do know what we're doing, and it does make sense for our teachers, and that's the way they want to teach, I think it's going to be really important in the future to be able to talk that through. So it was a great exper evidence-based experiment that we can probably use in, in our dialogue in the community in the months ahead. So data in the future, there's going to be two sets of data, actually, because the steel case who gave us the grant for the furniture, gave us a discount for the furniture, they're collecting data on their end, and they share out, and they'll do a presentation, and they'll do it to the board they offered. Um, so that's one piece of data. But then our teachers do APPs. So they're doing an uh, alternate, what's the stand for? Help me out. Uh, Professional portfolio. Thank you, professional project. Um, so they're, some of them are choosing furniture as their option, how the different learning spaces affect how they're teaching and affect student learning. And from that process, we have three different student groups that students need, um, that teachers need to create, and they can choose how they group the students and how they get data from those different student groups. Um, so a few people are actually doing that for their projects. So we'll have data from that um, at the end of the school year, too. It probably will be sooner, but so we'll have two different data sets about. And part of the reason I'm having the research class is that we're hoping that some of the kids will be like, I want to research this. <laughs> we're not there yet, but we're hoping. Thank you. They're and just moving to pick, forward without us. <laughs> building or no building, yeah. they're moving right. forward yeah. without <laughs> us. Yes. <laughs> I just wanted to piggyback on that as well. Um, uh, some of us were fortunate last week to go to the New Jersey School Boards Association workshop, and uh, one of the sessions in there also talked about what other districts are doing around flexible learning and how important it is for the economy of the future. And so uh, a lot of theory, a lot of really great work being done elsewhere, and I just love that the students and the teachers and the staff here are moving ahead uh, and, and, and so that we don't fall behind. And, and it's really, it's great what you guys are doing, and it's really going to be helpful, I think.
and one of the things we're talking about is like preparing kids for college. And I took pictures when I was at Rutgers this weekend of their new learning spaces look like this. <laughs> They're not putting in new learning spaces that look like their old learning spaces, which I think is also important for parents and students to know. Right. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to thank you for um, that first image that you showed of the um, postcard and defining success by that kind of statement from a student about what they were excited about, tomatoes and biology and football. And um, I think if we have students who write postcards like that, it says something's going very right. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks again. <coughs> okay. okay. And anything more for you, Steve? Okay. So then uh, we move on to item G, which is the harassment, intimidation, and bullying report. And this is a consent item. Um, but but uh, G2 is, an, is a vote. And so I need a um, motion for G2. Debbie in a second. Uh, Beth? Set. Okay, so now we move on to our board committee reports, and we're going to start with our student board member tonight, Sam Harshberger. <coughs> so take it away, Sam. Good evening. For our second report of student liaisons, Allie and I surveyed students on this year's new schedule changes. We asked students for, for their opinion of the schedule changes broadly, as well as how often they found themselves in the wrong classroom due to confusion over the schedule, <laughs> the effect of the later start time on their overall wellness, and how the changes have affected when they wake up and when they arrive at school. A total of 160 students were surveyed, with an even distribution of responses coming from freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors. They responded to the survey in Homeroom or through a voluntary online Google survey posted in grade-specific Facebook groups. Of the students surveyed, approximately two-thirds saw the new survey as an improvement on last year's schedule. 57% said that the later start time improved their overall wellness, and around 60% said the new schedule had led them to wake up later in the morning. Freshmen were less likely to say that the later start time and new schedule have impacted them significantly, and this is most likely because they have no means of comparison to last year's <laughs> schedule. 60% uh, of students reported arriving to school later in the morning, while 35% and 15% reported arriving at the same time or later respectively. Interestingly, of the 15% of students who reported, um, who reported arriving earlier at school than previously, 70% of those students support the new schedule. Given the rotating periods, a concern expressed early on uh, this year was that, was that students and staff would be confused about the, where their next period class would be. 60% of respondents said they were never at the wrong class due to confusion over their schedule. Approximately a quarter said that they found themselves in the wrong class once per week, and around 15% reported being in the wrong class twice or more per week. Perhaps unsurprisingly, support for the new rotating schedule was lower among students who reported being at the wrong classroom <laughs> due to confusion over their schedule uh, than among those who had no such confusion. Some students suggested that the time used for a six-minute morning break period would be better used to extend the lunch break period from 36 to 40 minutes. While we believe this might benefit some students, the time is critical for morning announcements, which provides students, faculty, and staff critical information for the coming day. For next month, we are looking to survey students on their use of lockers and common spa space within school premises. Additionally, Ali and I look forward to continuing to meet individually with board members over the coming weeks. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. <coughs> okay, and so now we move on to... Um, Quick question. Sure. Sam, I understand there's some of the kids were writing an app for the schedule. Is that something you're familiar with? I am. Uh, I can look into that and report it, back I to I just wonder if it was an app and working or if people were using it. I have not tried it personally. Okay. I know that there was an app in development uh, that is on iOS. Uh, I'm not sure beyond that. Okay. Do you have one other question, Michelle? Has the new schedule impacted how students are getting to school? Are sure. they being driven less? Are they walking more? Are they biking more? Because traffic in the morning yeah. is pretty ugly. And so I, just, I think it would just be interesting to find out whether or not they've adjusted their mode of transportation. 
Sure, I'll look into that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay, so now we're going to move on to um, our uh, other committee reports and start with the facilities, Chair Daphne Kendall. Okay, thank you, Pat. Um, so this facilities report is going to be uh, a team effort tonight. Um, I'll go over the four um, main points that we discussed at our meeting yesterday, some other information. Uh, we have the district's um, consultant on who's helping us with some mold issues that we're experiencing uh, in the building. John Smoyer from Ahara is here, and um, we'll call you up in a minute, and you can give us an overview of what's happening in the district. Um, we met yesterday. We discussed a few topics. One was status of the mold remediation. Um, and as I said, the consultant will provide an update of the steps being taken to address the mold issues experienced in the district. Um, we talked about the comprehensive maintenance plan, which is on uh, tonight's agenda. That's an annual um, summary of maintenance taking place throughout the district. We also talked about a meeting uh, that several members of the facilities committee, um, as well as, um, well, including the business administrator and facilities director, uh, met with officials from the municipality to discuss a framework for a review of services and where economies can be gained from a share services agreement. It was decided that the district and municipality would identify a consultant with experience in New Jersey working with towns and school districts on shared services. So Mr. DeShield, the town administrator, and Mrs. Kennedy, our business administrator, will work on the details of the scope of qualifications, and we will proceed from there. Uh, we plan on meeting again in November. We also discussed um, in facilities um, the status of efforts to honor uh, the memory of Bill Cirillo. And Bill Hare is chairing a subcommittee of the facilities uh, committee. Do you want to talk about that now? And then we'll go to the mold I'll try to be issue. quickly. OK, great. Go quickly on this. So. Thank you. We met recently to review the progress in the courtyard. The project, the project is growing in scope from a focus on a new deck to recovering old pathways that have been covered in dirt and growth, leveling these pathways, finding the drains to better drain the courtyard during the heavy rains we get, clearing out any piping from these drains to ensure drainage and evaluating the trees in the courtyard. Gary Weissman of the district is making arrangements for a contractor to come out and scope the pipes and drains in the courtyard to improve the drainage. We talked a bit at the meeting about maybe holding a community involvement afternoon to help with beautifying the courtyard, not asking parents to uh, cut down trees or s clear out drains, but just to help clear out. Um, Gary's already had some people come out and clear out the courtyard. It's, it's quite an improvement. Uh, we are also soliciting evaluating yeah, bids oh, in the courtyard at Riverside Elementary at School. Riverside. So we're also soliciting and evaluating bids for the construction of the deck. We got one bid in that was amazingly high, and uh, we intend to get a better bid, and we intend to have all this work, including the deck, finished in April. So in summary, the scope of the project has increased, but the end result should be quite an impressive courtyard. I don't know if, Gary, you want to add anything about... Um, yeah, uh, just to echo what, what, what Bill just said, um, we've made um, uh, quite a bit of effort in, in getting the courtyard cl cleared up as best we can at, to this point um, as we're, you know, trying to get some other, other things done throughout the district. But, um, and uh, we did have another contractor come out, Bill, and I also had a, a call from someone this afternoon, so we'll at least get a third, you know, a third number to look at. Um, so, um, and we'll just, you know, keep plugging away, and, and April is the... Uh, you know, is the target. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Gary. Um, so now, uh, John, if you have a chance uh, to come up, um, John Smoyer from Ahara Consultants is working with Gary Weissman on some of the mold issues that we've experienced this fall. Thank Hello, you. everyone. Uh, I'm John Smoyer from Ahara Consultants. We've been doing environmental work for the school district for over 15 years, and recently with the district in prepare, preparation for the new school year had encountered some questionable uh, mold issues in several of the buildings throughout the district. Uh, they called us in. We uh, evaluated doing visual uh, analysis of the spaces in question. We then conducted ambient air sampling in those areas and uh, have subsequently worked with uh, Gary with 
uh, within the results of what we had found to correct any issues that were elevated. Uh, I just wanted to make everybody aware of uh, when we did the ambient air testing, there were no abnormal spore types that were noted in any of those samples that we collected, and no spore counts that were elevated to an a, a, a above a concern level. Anything that we that was of in in the gray area in, in the concern area, Gary and his uh, he, he had brought in a couple of uh, contractors to do cleanups. We've done follow up uh, testing after subsequent testing after those cleanups were done, and all the levels had dropped drastically. This was, as we all know, this was a very unusual year for um, uh, relative humidity and moisture, especially towards the latter end of summer and the beginning of, of fall. And that equated to uh, Mother Nature blessing us with a lot of uh, additional mold spores in the air. So we had enc encountered uh, in some of those samples elevated levels, which I said, you know, had been addressed since. Um, we're going to be working we, in our discovery of everything, we, uh, we found that there are certain things that may be able to uh, inhibit this from happening next season, and we're going to work with the, the maintenance department to try and, and promulgate those uh, so those things don't happen again uh, the next year. There are certain things that, that, that can be enacted. Um, there are um, energy-saving um, uh, items that have been put in, in place that should be actually activated at times and relative humidity monitored so that the indoor air quality isn't compromised by what's going on in Mother Nature during the, uh, the end of uh, summer and, and beginning of fall. Uh, at, as of this point, we're in pretty good shape. Mother Nature is cooperating very nicely and the cleanups have shown uh, a, a very good outcome. So if there are any questions that anybody has uh, regarding. So I know a lot about mold. So my question is, when you found the ambient mold, oh, I'm sorry. When you found, measured the levels of mold in the ambient space, and mm -hmm. then you went in and addressed the situation, what technique or method did you use to remediate? I based, you know, again, we, we work uh, hand in hand with Hera on uh, the, the techniques and the methods for, for cleaning it up. Mm -hmm. And um, there was uh, certain products that we used, um, uh, a mold retardant and eliminating product. Um, and we didn't, do, we didn't do a lot of cleanup on our own. Uh, in the very beginning, when we started to get some of the, you know, some of the complaints and concerns coming in, um, you know, we, we were treading very carefully, but, you know, doing some of this light cleanup. Um, we then got to a point where... Um, we were a little concerned about, you know, what we were taking on. Um, and again, it, it not, not in the sense that, you know, we were finding it to the degree that we, you know, was really getting us, you know, mm -hmm. uh, overly concerned. But just, just the stuff that you're talking about, the techniques, products being used, um, you know, cordoning off areas. So, you know, we, we realized that that's, you know, that's a big part of, of proper cleanup, not, you know, it's one thing to clean up the area, but you want to make sure you don't, you know, contaminate or, 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 or disturb, create or a disrupt, situation right. mm -hmm. in, in another part of the building. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we, we've learned some since then on our own, you know, about what we, what we can do, um, you know, respiratory protection for our people, you know, gloves, goggles, things like that. Um, and we, you know, we monitor the contractors that are working with us, of course, but we kind of leave the professional work up to the professionals in that sense, you know. Um, you know, we're working with someone that has um, experience in cleaning up in cleaning up mold and mold remediation. Um, they utilized air scrubbers. Right. The air scrubbers. You know, when, the, when the professionals were, were mm -hmm. brought in, they used air, air scrubbers. They they set up containment right. mm -hmm. and and they quarantined off areas so that so that anything that was uh, would be inhibited from leaving the area, and they remediated it and then they uh, neutralized mm -hmm. at, after, as they left. So then we, we subsequently did our testing and found that the uh, levels were greatly reduced. Thank and, and, you. And Go ahead. I was just saying, and, and, and some people may think it's overkill, but 
we're really working in lockstep with these folks. So the slightest little thing that I'm just not comfortable with, whether it be with the contractor or our own people, to get a phone call. Is this right? Is that right? Is this the way to do it? Is that the way to do it? So we're really being very careful about how we, you know, how we approach the, the cleanup. Thank you. Are there any plans to do some subsequent testing in the next couple of months to make sure there hasn't been a return or a regrowth? Well, what, what our, our, our plans are is, is when we, um, you know, when an area is brought to our attention or we discover an area um, and the cleanup is done, mm -hmm. um, we do go in and, and test. There's also been areas that have been tested, uh, as John had mentioned, where, where some of the levels were somewhat, you know, elevated. Um, we go in and clean and then do a retest. Mm -hmm. So there's always a, there's always a way, a, a kind of a check and balance to make sure what we're doing is, did the trick. And if it didn't, then we, you know, we haven't had that happen yet, but if a test is done and we find that we haven't gotten it to the level where, where it needs to be, um, then we, we clean again. We help to make them aware of uh, water infiltration mm -hmm. to monitor, make sure that, you know, if there are any leaks or, or standing water's presence that, of that material that that's monitored co closely because that's, uh, that's what will uh, make the mold uh, proliferate. So. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Quick question on the, oh, the so the, the reports that you put together. Yes. There's graphs, I guess bar graphs are called, and they show background counts. Yes. I didn't understand that because okay. I, I remember when we talked in the meeting, you mentioned controls. Control samples are the backgrounds usually. Same thing. Yes, one and the same. Because yeah. it looked like it was mentioning a, it'd be mentioning rooms. Is it so when you're doing the control there, for room, is the, it outside? Usually, if it's available for us to do outside, we'll do outside comparative sampling. But if the weather is inhibiting that, if it's raining outside, we do a comparative sample inside in a non-complaint area, somewhere where we know, and then do the comparisons within the area also. Okay. So sometimes you will see that there isn't an outside control sample because we had to do an interior control at some point, just because Mother Nature changes every. You know, every time we come out, and we want to try to address it when the accident incident is occurring. So sometimes, if you get outside of that window, an hour could make a big difference. Actually, when it comes that was to mold. that was a, a big takeaway from when you talked to us in the facilities committee. Mm -hmm. Was that so much of it is just decaying leaves create Correct. mold, different types, the different color of the leaf is a different type of mold, and exactly. those yeah, are blowing in the wind into our rooms. And then in every, at, at every hour, if I test t today, you know, one hour, and then I come back in two, uh, two hours later, and I run the same test in the same location, I may get very different results because uh, it's, a, it's mother nature. And especially at this time of year, during the fall, the decomposition of, uh, of foliage outside in greatly increases uh, mold spores in the air. And it also depends on if, uh, if it just rained, if, if, uh, if everything's starting to dry out, you get a proliferation of, uh, of spores that greatly increase, you get a spike at that point. So, you know, it, it all depends, you know, you're trying to compare, you're trying to see, we want to protect what's inside. We want to make sure that the people that are working inside of the, the area are, are, are the ones that, you know, aren't being exposed to anything. So we have to make sure that we gauge everything properly so that, you know, we get a, a true uh, snapshot in time of exactly what's going on when there's a concern. So, so I know that we discussed this yesterday, John, but hmm? I was wondering it, so maybe it would be better if you more, more directly answered it. But sure. So every year we have trees fall and we have... Um, hmm. Uh, you know, spores in the air. Why this year was it such an issue um, for Princeton, but also other schools in New Jersey? Well, the, over this is on uh, this season, um, August and September, there were 37 days of humidity that was over 80 plus percent. We also had one of the lo the uh, largest amounts of rainfall in recorded history for our, for our area. As we all know, we didn't have any brown grass almost anywhere at all this year. We had green grass almost everywhere we were. And, and that's one of the reasons that the, the mold was just able to proliferate and, and, uh, and it's, it's just been an, a very unusual year and that's why we, in the news, so many other school districts are having it a lot worse. And I, have, uh, I have a few of those clients that, that are in, you know, uh, that they're moving on right now and everything is going well because Mother Nature is cooperating again, so. 
Sister Wayness. Um, one other question. So obviously we can't test every room of every school, I assume. Um, so how did you know which rooms, and I, don't, I guess, Gary, that's a question for you, which rooms you asked for testing to be done, and were there any room where there was a complaint? And then when you come back in the future, will mm -hmm. you test those same rooms or, or other rooms? Yeah, I mean, it started off with, with the um, complaints that we received. Um, in the various schools. So those were the rooms that we focused on in that initial thrust of, of testing. Um, as, as time went on, we've got some more concerns that came in, and every concern that has come in, we've addressed it, either with the initial testing to see, you know, what we have, or we go in and clean, um, because maybe the visual inspection showed that, you know, there could be some, Something some old spores. Um, mm -hmm. So we're basically doing it and have been doing it based on the complaints that we've received. And I just want to make sure I'm clear. And even, even if a HERA came in and, you know, based on, you know, three rooms at, at, at a particular school. But as part of looking at those three rooms, they've, they've done walkthroughs of the buildings. And by a random sort of walkthrough, possibly identified other locations that weren't on the original list. And then those yeah, during our invis visual rooms. investigation, we look at the perimeter of the area in question, and if we feel that there's anything out of the ordinary in one of those, the, the, the Gary has given us carte blanche to be able to sample those areas. It wasn't very much, because even the inspectors have found it was uh, minor infractions that they really found in most of the areas, other than the ones where we had a slightly elevated area, and, and at that point, they just took uh, control and cleaned the entire space. So, uh, Gary, what's the nature of a complaint that you might get? Like when someone, you said you get a complaint, what, what do people complain about? Are they I could smelling get, um, something? Are they seeing something? What is it that's... Uh, must, musty odors, um, some people, um, you know, having some sort of, in, in their estimation, some sort of reaction. I'm not doubting it, but I mean, they're, they're telling me they have some sort of reaction every time they're in the room. Um, so we're not only, you know, checking for mold, but we're also looking at the HVAC systems. So, so to answer your question, it's basically, you know, we're getting people saying that, you know, I don't feel well. Um, in some cases, you know, they see something that looks suspect. They're not mm -hmm. sure what it is, but, you know, can we look at it? Um, <coughs> and we kind of, you know, kind of take it from there. But again, I just, we just don't leave it at, you know, okay, well, you say there's mold, well, then we'll, we'll clean up and walk out. If somebody's really not feeling well, it could be a lot of reasons, you know, it could be airflow, it could be a lot of different things. So, you know, we, we, we really check out the whole room or the whole area. Okay. And my other question is different is, is HVAC, does that have anything to do with it? Or if, if these rooms were air conditioned, would that have, would that change the prevalence of mold in the rooms? John, do you want to speak to yeah, that? Yeah. Okay. If I could answer that. The, um, a lot of the, these built, your buildings are of different age categories, and they have many different systems that have been added over the years. So we have some classrooms that have unit ventilators that don't have air conditioning built into them. We have window units that supplement those spaces, and there's a there's an unbalanced balance that goes on because of those kind of situations. And that lends, we also know that we have to have a certain percentage of fresh air introduced to the spaces at all times for students. And sometimes that causes a dumping of molds and spores from the outside into the space because there is no ventilation per se in those classrooms because it wasn't built into it at the time that it was designed. So sometimes by incorporating an overall HVAC system for an, an entire building fit out, that sometimes eliminates a lot of these problems because electronically then the, the dew points, the humidity can be monitored by the system and dampers opened and closed as necessary. That lessens, uh, greatly lessens the, uh, the chance of that. Thank you. And John, can, I, can I just build on, on, on your answer a little bit more or ask another question? So you, uh, you referenced some changes in protocol that might help us in the future. Mm -hmm. um, can you go into a little more detail sure. as to what you what that would be in terms of what we might be able to do over the summer? Because for energy savings, schools have for years turned off turned the off AC so and the, they clean the room and then they just they, and they close it up, up until September, right? Exactly, until um, August, until the teachers come back. And then the classroom has been sealed up for a couple of weeks or almost a month or so, sometimes longer. And at that point, the teacher encounters things in their room because the room has been cl closed up. Uh, 
what happened this past year with all of the, the high humidity levels, right. that wasn't monitored. So that only encouraged the growth of molds and things within clo enclosed spaces. So one of the things that we'd like to, to uh, recommend is that we look at that energy efficiency schedule, maybe uh, monitor also the humidity levels that are in, at that time in July and August, and may, maybe activate the univentilators or the, uh, the, the air conditioning systems so as to lessen the chance of having that humidity build up in the interior spaces as it did and does in those cases. So it's, a, it, you know, it's, it's paying attention to what's going on outside. And, and adjusting the interior spaces to accordingly. And sometimes that means overriding the energy efficiency because right. you're gonna, on the other side of it, you don't want something to, to grow right. inside. Okay, so. thank you. Mm -hmm. Gary, can I ask you one last question? So with all the mold, do you have your staff, are they inspecting the classrooms pretty regularly? Yeah, and they're, they're even more, um, um, they're even more in tune with it now. Um, you know, so they they know as they go through the the, um, the rooms and their staffs go through when they clean that to be more uh, yeah, vigilant when it comes to seeing anything that looks out of the ordinary that maybe they haven't really, you know, <laughs> thought of paying much attention to before, but having more of a heightened sense of awareness as to you know what's really going on within the room and then reporting it to their supervisor who then in turn you know reports to me and then we you know we investigate from there. So my question for the two of you is, um, uh, in December, we're going to be asking our community to vote on, on a referendum that includes HVAC systems. If, if the community were to support something like that, would, would, would that help in the future with the type of issues that you're looking at now? Absolutely. Definitely. Really. Yeah. yeah. In, a, in a lot of our classrooms, um, you know, we have window units, window air conditioners, you know, um, and... And there's a good many of them that, I mean, we're, we've changed them over as they, as they age out that actually have thermostatic controls. But a lot of them are the older units that they're either on or off. Right. Um, and they get overridden by teachers very often where, you know, if you have control, central control of them, the teacher may go in and they may think that they can turn it down to 60 or up to 75, but it's really not going to go that way because the overriding system allows that. And a lot of times those individual, the teachers in their individual spaces affect the spaces on either side of them by doing that, by manipulating things. And if you, if you take that control away from the ind individuals, the uh, occupants, sometimes that helps the overall condition of the building very frequently. So that's another reason that it's, it's, a, it's a good idea to look into actually putting blanket over the buildings. So I, I just have one more question. Just um, to go back to what Gary said, how um, some of our staff might not have been cleaning things they need to be cleaned. I just wanted everyone to understand what Gary meant by that. So could you tell a story really quickly of the encyclopedias? Oh, <laughs> sure. Right, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we just, we, we were uh, tasked with another, at, a, at another district to uh, find, uh, there was a smell in one of them, in the, in the library. And they, we could not find the smell. There were no leaks. There was no water in, that, that we saw. There was no historical. So they decided to purge the, purge the room. There was no other way of doing it. So we were tasked at doing that under controlled measures with a, with a mold crew doing it. And at one point we got to one of the bookshelves that was along one of the outer, outer walls. And there was this lovely uh, encyclopedia uh, complete set. Beautiful, <laughs> A through Z, it was fantastic. Well, I myself went to grab N just to start because it's the center and N wouldn't come out. So as I pulled, I pulled harder and a, and a section of about nine of the books were all melded together on the back end on the bottom. The fa facade of them looked fantastic. There was nothing wrong. But the back was just one big melt because what had happened was there was either water infiltration from the bottom, there was groundwater that came up. We, could, we didn't determine it at the time, but that had been there for many a year untouched. So one of the other recommendations that I had made to the, to, to, you know, the other day while we were there is it's a lovely to have a purge every once in a while. That's just one of those things that's akin to uh, allowing you to realize that, hmm, maybe, the, maybe we should uh, shuffle those books around a little bit. And, and John, so. one more question. So the, sure. the, um, the kind of system that you would recommend that we be looking at is um, assuming the referendum passes and we're able to, to put this... Um, HVAC blanket over the schools, as mm -hmm. you said, would be one that um, can 
read the humidity levels where we, and, and then be automatically adjusted if the Absolutely. humidity level gets above a certain level it would the ac it would, would just automatically kick on. trigger the dampers to close at certain right. points so that you don't have dumping and then you have a hot fresh air you know they the systems it's it automatically adjust they're all uh, they're all nowadays computer automated okay all of them Thank you know you. so any other questions Thank you all. Thank you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk. Any more for you, Daphne? No, I'm okay. Um, I, I, mean, I can talk more about more. Yeah. About more, I learned a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so now we're on to uh, finance with Chair Bill Hare. Finance Committee met in open session yesterday, October 29th at 6 p.m. in this building with our auditor to review the auditor's draft report of our financial systems. Um, I think I could say the report is impressive for many reasons, especially in that it shows that our financial systems work well with almost zero errors. Um, to me, that, that was impressive. The, uh, the draft audit also showed that the finances of our district are getting tighter with less flexibility to deal with the variations in the budget from year to year. Um, the committee also had a brief follow-up discussion on some of our cost-saving initiatives relating to health insurance and pharmaceuticals. Our next meeting will be on November 27th at 10.30 a.m. <coughs> in this building. And I think, Greg, you had something somewhat related to this to talk about in the November 6th election. Sure. Thanks, Bill. So one of the other topics that, that we discussed um, was uh, that on the November 6th ballot, we don't have our own referendum, but there is a state referendum that does involve uh, a $500 million question uh, for f if it were to pass for funds that go, uh, some go for uh, improvements to schools in the areas of security, some on, in, in uh, water infrastructure, uh, and as along with uh, grants for higher education and voc tech schools. Uh, there's some confusion uh, among the public as to if any of that pertains to, to local, our local district. And, and the, the fact is that this is a statewide uh, referendum. If it were to pass, the Department of Education is going to design the grant programs for all these components, we know that 100 million of the 500 million would be for water improvement in the infrastructures for districts across the state. The, the rest of the money, we don't know how it's going to be allocated yet. So uh, what some of our fellow districts are saying, and I, I think it's the same for us, is uh, if there were to be any money for school security improvements in the future that flow from that, uh, and if Princeton were able to, to be applying for it, then that's, that could be an offset for, for some of the things we're looking at in the... Um, in our own referendum, but the fact is that as, at least as of last week, the New Jersey School Boards Association didn't really have specifics yet as to how that was going to be designed. So what other districts are saying is, you know, that's to be determined, but, but it's on our radar. And so I think that's, that's the, what we, we discussed. Can we throw out one last thing about sure. finance? I think Stephanie, today was the day. Today was the day. Can you tell us about the excitement of today? It was very exciting today. It was very exciting. We had our uh, bond uh, resale refunding today. Um, it, I was able to watch it online. It was very exciting. You could see all the bids coming in. Um, well, I did hand out a, a short sheet to the to the um, board. We'll have it. We'll have um, that was just put together quickly so I could share the information with the board this evening. There will be a complete. Well, thank you. There will be a complete um, uh, report that'll come out. But the short answer, the short story is that over the bonds that were um, refinanced, we're going to save five hundred and twenty-four thousand dollars over five hundred twenty-four thousand dollars over the um, life of the balance of those bonds. The um, the folks that were. A uh, stiffle, sti I, um, I'm saying that wrong. Stiefel. Stiefel. Um <coughs> They processed the bond sale for us, and they were very happy with the results. And um, and 
so was so was Phoenix Advisors. Uh, so yeah, that's good news. Yeah, what was the interest rate on that? Interest rate, uh, average interest rate is 2.26. Nice. For those, that time period. And, and we were very... Um, do you remember what we estimated for um, referendum bonds? I think it was 4, 4%? Four mm -hmm. so, right. So, numbers. so yeah. Um, good, so, good interest rate environment to issue yeah. bonds at right now. They, yeah, they had, they had a lot of compliments else. for us to, yeah. um, to why we were able to achieve that. Do you, do you remember? Uh, no, I know. Yeah. <laughs> Financial management. Um, uh, 21 great audits. <laughs> yeah, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Bert. Thank you. Yeah, that's Thank wonderful. You. Thank you, Stephanie. Yeah, it's good news. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so now we're on to uh, um, personnel with, De with Chair Debbie Bronfeld. Great. The Personnel Committee met on Monday, October 22nd. The Student, student Services is still verifying Princeton addresses for many Princeton charter school families in compliance with the state's domicile law. The district has shared the names of the charter school. Snail mail letters have been sent to the families. A student's family only needs to live in Princeton when they enter the lottery. Families can move to other towns and still attend Princeton Charter School. The new domicile town will be, would pay the tuition to Princeton Charter School. The committee reviewed the revised 2018-2019 athletic coach evaluation forms for PHS and JW coaches. The new evaluations allow for more feedback to coaches. The new forms are on the agenda to be approved tonight. The committee reviewed initial drafts of evaluation forms for administrators and optional forms for tenured administrators to create alternate alternative professional project planning. Both sets of forms are still being reviewed by staff and HR. The district will be holding a substitute nurse job fair on Thursday, November 15th in the Valley Road building from 3.30 to 6 p.m. The fair is needed to increase our pool of substitute nurses so we have coverage at all schools. In the winter months, many people get sick and we also need coverage for the many field trips we offer. The personnel committee wants to encourage students who have 60 college degrees I'm sorry, who have 60 college credits to apply for their substitute teaching certificate so they can substitute teaching during semester breaks. Currently, the process takes about six weeks. Tonight, we will be approving the staff recommendations for the equity leadership team, the school and district green team, and the school improvement panels. The committee also reviewed the fall HR newsletter, which highlights the new school-wide initiatives for 2018-2019 and welcomes all new staff to the district. Our next meeting will be on Monday, November 19th in Valley Road, and this is a closed meeting. Thank you. Thanks, Debbie. Uh, just a question about the charter school audit. When do we expect that will be completed? Letters were sent out. And there was snail mail, so anything that comes back will go from there. Great. Okay. Thanks. Um, you know, it's a, it's a slow process. So, um, a friend of mine has a daughter at the charter school, and she was telling me that the instructions uh, sent by the charter school were very confusing, and that she had spent uh, thirty minutes. She's two children there, one child in PPS, and um, she spent thirty minutes putting in all her information, and she wasn't done yet. And then she picked up the phone and called. So she suggested that perhaps because um, we have so many families non-responding, that perhaps it would be helpful to um, put the instructions, send them to the charter school and ask them to distribute it to their families. Um, because I think whatever was communicated isn't easily understood. All right. Um, I will follow up with Mickey what she has talked about with their um, head. Because, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I don't have an answer. But I will follow up. Okay. Thank you. Debbie, just a couple of questions on the uh, coaching evaluation. Do you know um, when did they present that, or did they just did that just pass before the personnel committee? Was that presented the <coughs> coaching evaluation forms to the coaches? No, no, no. To to you as to the personnel committee. We've seen it a couple times. Okay, so um, I had a couple of questions. Do do we know? Who evaluates the coaches? How many people evaluate the coaches? Yeah. yeah. Lou. <laughs> yeah, so when the, uh, the head coaches evaluate the assistant coaches, uh -huh. the director of athletics evaluates the uh, head coaches. And uh, 
basically Annie and Gary Snyder evaluates the director of athletics. Okay, that's great. There's just a lot of questions on the evaluation about how the coaches interact with parents, how they communicate with parents, and how they communicate with other coaches. So I'm just wondering where the, you know, where the evaluators are going to get that information. Are they going to get it from complaints? Are they going to get it from emails? Like how are they, how are they going to get that information about how the coaches interact with parents? Did, right? I think the coaches were, uh, were very appreciative that they had the opportunity to re-review the evaluation forms and to give input into modifying the evaluation forms so that it actually is more uh, meaty as far as and specific as to what areas they have excelled in and what areas they may need improvement in. And a lot of those come from uh, the commendations that uh, come in from parents as well as recommendations in areas that parents may be concerned about. So I think uh, it's those, uh, the, the, that input that is, is sent to them is, is tabulated and, you know, put together so that when the evaluation is done of, of each and every coach, it reflects not only the, uh, the work of the uh, coach, but also any concerns that may have been raised as well as any commendations that may have been given. So any concerns that were raised by... Any concerns that were raised by a parent or uh, by a student? Okay, so those those would be concerns raised by a parent that would have complained. It may have Lou, been I'm not I'm not putting you on the spot. My, my no, I'm just my, saying that. my concern about the way this evaluation is done is that mm -hmm. it's an evaluation done by uh, right that that talks about the way they interact with parents, right. but parents have no input. Students, uh, the athletes have no input, and it talks about how they interact with the athletes, whether or not they, um, and and it also does not, you know, we as a board, talk, we as a board talk all about uh, ad, as we make our shift, and I'm going to make this the last sword you die on. Um, <laughs> hmm. You know, you know, you know how we are. You know uh, how we are, um, but first of all. I appreciate the athletic department, and I know how long it has taken us to get to this point. So I am first going to offer my appreciation to the personnel committee and to the athletic department for um, getting us this far. But as we talk about equity and as we talk about um, how far we've come with the student athlete and health and wellness, this does nothing for that. So if we are going to put forth a um, an evaluation form, this talks about how well we do at winning. This does not talk about the student athlete. In fact, we don't even hyphenate student athlete all the way through it. There are typos all over it. There's inconsistencies all over it. So, so if, if we're going to do it, I, I want to do it well, but I also want to do it with with the boards, if the board's going to approve it, we need to send a message to the athletic department from the top down that it is, and I don't want to speak for the entire board, I'll, I'll speak from, from, from my position, but it is, it, is our, it is my wish that that field, course, court, is an extension of the classroom. It's not about how many games we win, it's about the child that we develop. It's about what we do with the child. Athletics is an extension of our curriculum. It's not about winning. It's about developing the mental toughness of the child. There's a piece in here about how well did the child, how well did the athlete progress, but there's no there's no real, you know, they're, they're, they're getting to a good point of, of being able to actually mark that. So, I mean, a lot of progress, a lot of great progress, but if, if, if we're really going to do this, then we need to be accountable to the athlete. Are the coaches beginning and ending practices on time so the students can plan accordingly? Are we being respectful of the student athlete's time? you know, those kind of things. Are we allowing the students to ride home with their parents when their parents come to the game? 
Or are we making them ride all the way back to the school, get off the bus, making the parents drive all the way back to the school, and then ride home? What are we doing about that? Some coaches allow it, some coaches don't. Our policy says if the parent's at the game, the child can leave the game and hop in the car with their parents. That's what our policy says. Some coaches allow that. Some coaches don't. Some coaches allow it for Cranberry students and they don't allow it for other students. Some coaches allow it for Cranberry students if they're on the other side of Route 1 and they don't allow it if they're on this side of Route 1. So where is the student athlete, where is health and wellness and where is our priority for the student in this? Because really, we do athletics to enhance the student. I'm sorry, Evelyn. I'm confused. I, I I don't see anything about winning in in the. Yeah, I'm looking through I'm it too. I'm, I don't. And no. All, all I see in here well, is we, about the student where, and the, the student's so well-being. I, I just don't increase know. their technical skill, tactical knowledge, and level of fitness. Okay. Okay. But what we don't say is, and we say provide appropriate guidance and support for athletes who may experience difficulty in achieving success on the playing field. What I don't see is any section that says that we are respecting the athlete's time, that we are, um, I sent Steve about four things. What my, my question is, if we're looking at success, we want to make sure as a board that we are defining success in a positive way for the athletic department. The board hasn't defined success, the athletic department has defined success. Um. I well, think we do, it's. I we, think it's good. I think it's. I think it's a lot so for these the first coaches. Is coaches are committed to their student athletes and to their teams. And the first standard is promotes positive, promotes positive character and citizenship and student in student athletes. Yes, um, I think there are a lot of good things in here, but I don't think there's if all, if this is not being reviewed by the athletes, if it's not being reviewed by parents, I, I, I'm not sure. Yeah, that's true. That's true. It's, it's not a 360 degree feedback evaluation, but it, okay. it is it is a significant in, increase and uh, as you said, uh, yeah. pro progress since the original forms were developed uh, years ago, and it also helps to uh, denote in certain areas exactly what the criteria are, so that coaches can look to say, okay, maybe I didn't I didn't do the best in this area specifically, and know exactly what their deficiency may be. But the fact that the coaches had a chance to sit down as a group and talk about the various areas and talk about the importance, as you noted, student athletes, and it is not about winning. It is about yeah. improving skills and, and having right. fun and you know, having a team building experience and, and promoting character. Um, those are some of the greatest teams I've played on. I know some of the students that went to Princeton High School. Uh, those are some of the best times that they've had. And I think that what's in the evaluation form is a notation that the students are what we're here for. Uh, and the athletics is secondary, but the student athlete needs to know that they're supported at all levels, whether they're a coach as a teacher in the school district or, or not, and that all students, you know, regardless of uh, their socioeconomic background, are being recognized for their abilities, and the coaches are being recognized for their abilities to connect with those students on a regular basis. Okay. There's a, and there's a typo in standard four. I, I just wanted to comment, and, and I'm on the personnel committee, so I've seen this before, but, but one thing I think is missing, and that goes back to the equity conversation we had about equity being involved in everything we do. And I know Betsy and Daphna and probably the whole um, equity committee is aware of the incident that happened at the beginning of the school year where a number of students were not uh, aware of special equipment they would need to have in order to try out for sports at the middle school. And so th this, this, and the, 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 it's bad enough they weren't informed. The response of the coach, which was basically, hey, you don't have it, too bad you're not paying attention, or whatever the case may be. It was not responsive mm -hmm. nor sensitive to the fact that um, equipment for certain sports is expensive. And even though some coaches did notify, say, if you want to try out for 
tennis, you be, you have to have sneakers mm -hmm. and you have to have a racket. And if you don't have this stuff, let me know and we'll make it available to you. But so our our message is 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 clearly not consistent amongst our coaches. So I would like to see something in here that addresses the need to ensure accessibility to the degree that they can. Um, because if we're going to talk about equity, and especially in sports when there's specialized equipment that's needed, um, I think the coaches need to be sensitive to that and try to line things up ahead of time. All right, I'll point out something else. And, and Michelle, mm -hmm. you and I were both there, so we probably don't get a second bite at the apple, even though we should have said this before. But, um, you know, one of the things that I've, I've talked about sports a lot, being a former cross-country guy myself, is in cross-country. Everybody gets to run, whether you're really good or really bad, you still get to run. And um, I had a child who was, in the, who was on the swim team here at PHS, and he was not the best swimmer by any stretch, but he got to swim in every meet. And there are coaches who do that. And some of it's sports specific. I understand that. Mm -hmm. But the idea that, you know, it's not uniform across the, the, the you know, I, I heard of a story of someone who wanted to try, a, a, um, well, I don't even say what sport it is, but wanted to try something within a sport. And the coach said, hey, we, you're not going to win at that. So don't even try. And so that's the other approach. Or, hey, there's, we're only looking for the five best people to do this thing and everyone else, you know, out. So, there should be some way of of giving coaches encouragement to broaden the the opportunity for people who maybe want to try something. I think it's true for other things too, like music and other things. But at least we're talking about sports today. Maybe that should be in there too somewhere. As coach allows broad participation versus narrow participation. But that's also a finance thing. So we have to decide. We, we have to decide if that's where we're going. We're well, going. Um, like for, it depends on the sport. You can't have a yes, basketball team right. with 50 guys on the court. Right, but right, on right. the other hand, you know, our, our old swim, I'm sure the new swim coach is the same, but our old swim coach was very mindful of he had, he had you know, children with disabilities mm -hmm, who swam. Mm -hmm, and, yeah. you know, and you could have a different coach who'd be like, hey, this person can't do that, right? So, and people who weren't disabled, they just weren't great swimmers. Mm -hmm. So he made sure that there was a place for everyone, and it didn't cost money. It just was something that he made a commitment to. And it was really valuable. So, yep. again, maybe we put that in there somewhere. And related to what Michelle was saying, this consistency, right? The need for a consistent message. Um, one thing the equity committee is talking about is the best way to ensure that the message is put out consistently. And that may be something we, we may ask the policy committee to consider. And so under that first part, adheres to all board policies and procedures, that, I mean, this needs to be standard. And we as a board have to figure out the best way to make that, make that happen. I will, I will mention that following that, the incident you described, the, uh, the athletic director immediately responded to that, is to that issue and, and provided that consistent message. But you can reinforce it if we were to add it here. Although I have to say, this is light years ahead of the forum that we had had in the past. You know, and there are things in here such as actively communicates with teachers, guidance counselors, child study team, and parents to ensure the social emotional health of every student athlete. You, we didn't find that in past forms, and I imagine many districts don't have that kind of a, a standard. So um, we're making progress. Yeah, I appreciate that. Okay, anything else, Debbie? Yeah. Okay. Um, so now we move on to um, policy. Chair Greg Stankowitz. <laughs> Thanks, Pat. Uh, so very briefly, we've got a number of policies for first and second reading for consideration tonight. We'll get to that very soon. So just very, very briefly, uh, as uh, many of you can remember, uh, we are in the midst of, tra of transitioning to a new policy manual. And I just want to thank my fellow members of the policy committee for working really hard. I want to thank our business administrator and Patty Gaynor. Um, we are redoubling our efforts, literally and figuratively, to try to get as much of the policies reviewed as possible before the end of this year. So we met on October 19th uh, to review the policies that, that are up before the board today. Uh, going forward, we're going to be meeting this Friday, November 2nd. We have a new time. So we'll be meeting starting at 8.30 in the morning. Um, public comment time will start at 10 o'clock to 10.30. And we're going to be meeting twice a month from now on. So uh, our upcoming dates are November 6th, 2nd, 16th, December 7th, and December 14th. And, and just to give the public just a, a very quick sort of roadmap of where we're going, we'll be presenting 
sections of the policy manual at the same time. And, and so we're, the, the goal is to get through as quickly as possible because we realize that there are policy issues that, that we need to focus on, but it's really hard to, uh, when you're in the midst of a transition. So I want to thank you know, all the members of the policy committee for, for doing all this, and the results of, of this month will be up in a couple of minutes. So thanks. Okay, thanks, Greg. Oh, I have a question. Um, we're not talking about it? Okay. Um, <laughs> withdraw the question. Okay. So then we're moving on to um, student achievement. Let's Thank share a you. Uh, we met in closed session. We met twice this month. We met in closed session on October 17th from 2 to 5, and in open end closed session on Friday, October 26th from 11.30 to 3. Um, field trips and overnight trips were approved and are on tonight's agenda. Gary Snyder and Kelly Curtis attended student achievement on October 26th to discuss um, the Python course over enrollment at, the, at Princeton High School. Um, the issue is that many students were unable to register for Python this school year. Representatives from Princeton University's computer science department also attended and offered some suggestions for ways that the university might work with PHS to collect data and determine some creative solutions. Um, we thank them for being there and for their efforts. Mr. Snyder presented a proposal that while it would require additional staff for the 2019-2020 school year, would address the demand for Python while also providing a flexible solution. Computer science teachers are, are also certified in mathematics. So this could be if we had the funds for additional staff, it could be um, the flexibility to, to currently teach computer science and math and add on computer science as the um, demand would increase. Um, it also fits into space constraints at Princeton High School in the computer spaces that we have. So that was one topic. Um, the committee also discussed the possibility of using the PPS cable channel in a more effective manner. Michelle, this was your idea, and I want you to know this has been um, taken the next step. So Lou, Gold Lou Goldstein and Valerie Francois attended, and Lou shared with us this could be a win-win for our district if it became a 24-7 educational public access channel. It could potentially bring in some revenue that might be able to be used to hire an additional staff member in communications to help Valerie with all of the <laughs> communications that we need to, to get out. It would connect the town with the work of the school district in a more effective way. Um, and um, it also could, there could be possibilities for student work to be um, a part of that as well. We have some TV production courses at both the middle, middle school and the high school. So there's a lot to look into, um, and we will look into that. Um, I think it, we have to meet with Verizon and Comcast and create some programming to have available, but it does need to be a 24-7 effort. So stay tuned for more to come on that. I practice that. Yes. Um, I'm looking to see if any of you are awake. Stay tuned. Get it? Okay. Um, we then... <laughs> Uh, we then adjourned into closed session. The next student achievement meeting is Friday, November 16th. That meeting is closed. The next public student achievement meeting is Friday, November 30th at 1130 a.m. And the public is encouraged to attend. So I just wanted to add something, unless you wanted to go. I just wanted to thank uh, Professor David August with Princeton University. Um, so uh, a lot of times people um, come to us and say, we well, didn't think of this. And... Um, the solutions are usually much more complicated than it would appear. And so Professor August um, really worked to understand um, our limitations. Um, he has um, visited our computer science space at the high school. Um, the Principal Snyder um, showed him around. And um, Steve started the meeting just by saying how we're, we're living in a time where it's a very divisive time. Pe people are very negative. Um, and that's not constructive. And Professor August has been extremely uh, constructive for the district. And um, he brought in two of his colleagues. Um, I went to an engineering school. I felt like I was right back in college. Um, and we had a really um, great conversation. And really, when we talk about collaboration with community partners, that is exactly what it looks like. So I just wanted to thank Professor August just for his time and his dedication <coughs> and his understanding. And as soon as he understood something, he said, now I get it. And um, he was just great to work with, and we're very grateful to work with him. So thank you. Thanks. I was just going to point out about the television channel. Maybe I'll steal Mr. Montgomery's thought here. But um, you know, it really, you have an opportunity there to make it student run, yep. right. not just student having a little chance to participate. But it could be a club that you, know, you have an <coughs> adult kind of making sure that 
nothing too terrible is happening, but let the kids <laughs> manage it, right? I mean, that would yeah. be a huge be thing for certain kids to be able to actually manage a, a TV station yeah. in yeah. high school, right? So and it, you should think big and, you know, given that there's no, there's no union contract on this, there's no, you know, requirements of any kind, like you can think really out of the box yeah. and make it something that, that kids can, you know, be really proud of. So, like yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I like Wayne's world. <laughs> Everybody got that. Yeah. Okay. Um, moving on. Uh, Daphne had a quick update on ad hoc uh, alternative revenue. So, um, so uh, the board is continuing to look for ways to ease the burden on the taxpayer, and so um, the superintendent and I have been in conversations. Um, with an entity, and we believe that um, we should have some updates uh, maybe as soon as next week. Great, thank you. Um, and finally, equity committee with Chair Bick, Betsy Bagley. Yes, we met in open session Thursday, October 4th at 9.30. The committee, as you know, unanimously approved the change of status of this committee from ad hoc to permanent. Um, uh, Mr. Pat Lenahan attended equity to, up to update the committee on the visual and performing arts department's data collection efforts. So the VPA staff completed surveys related to equity that Annie and Patrick Lenahan have, uh, had, had created. Um, they are now being reviewed, and a parent survey has been sent via email to Princeton uh, public school parents as well as paper copies for those who need that. So parents out there, if you have not done, um, or in board members, if you have received the survey and haven't completed it, you have until November 2nd to do so. Um, we do really want to, exp to understand the parents' experience. Um, Eddie Cohen attended Equity to share a very similar presentation that he shared tonight, and we thank Eddie for this initiative, and we look forward to seeing such programs in other subject areas as well, potentially. Uh, the committee discussed the roles and responsibilities of the new school equity leadership teams. And then we adjourned into closed session to discuss the development of an external equity fund um, that also continued at an additional closed session meeting on October 5th at 12 noon. The next equity committee meeting will be on November 12th, Monday at 12 noon. We usually meet the first Thursday of every month, but we're not meeting this Thursday. So November 12th at 12 noon, the first portion is a closed session, and the open session begins at 1.30, and, and the public is welcome to attend. Um, one small note that I'll say, Steve, based on what you mentioned about the DC trip. Um, I'm very proud that that is a trip, as you'll all remember, from the equity fund that we approved a few years ago. We ensured that every single student in this district is, is able to go on the DC trip, regardless of whether it, they're able to pay. The, J, the JWPTO has contributed to this as well, and so we thank them for their generosity. As a parent, my son just got back, loved the trip, so I would echo what Steve said. This is a really important trip for all of our students, and I'm so glad that they all get to go. Thank you. That's Just great. on a note of equity and um, talking about uh, the tutoring uh, at, and our partnerships with the university, I just noticed, I, I did notice on our agenda tonight that we have uh, six tutors at the Idea Center and the university uh, gives us those tutors. They pay 75% of their uh, stipend monies. They've been doing that for years now. Um, and I just think that is a, a great asset. Um, and they tutor our students at a very, uh, for uh, very high level courses. Um, and tutoring at, at that high level can, can be very costly. Uh, and they do that for free. So, and now that our breaks are flexible and they have tiger time, um, every student would have that, that free period available where they can get that tutoring now where that wasn't available with the old schedule um, so it really really is a great thing and I do appreciate the university's mm -hmm. uh, willingness to, to help us so it, it's a great partnership okay all right so we move on now to item <laughs> I which is uh, so thank you committee chairs and everyone in the committee for all your hard work one more question yes Michelle some feedback that I've been hearing about our committee meetings being in closed session and open session. And so my question is, are we closing committee meetings, because, you know, we talk a lot about transparency, um, based on this statute that allows us to go into closed session as a board? Um, 
So I'll take, I'll answer that. Um, mm -hmm. There is a board policy on committees that our policy mm -hmm. committee just reviewed. It's in the 9,000s. And it says, committee meetings shall be open to the public at the discretion of the chairperson, mm -hmm. except that a majority of the committee or the chairperson may open the meeting to the public or invite persons whose knowledge or expertise might be useful. So we do operate many of our committees mostly in open session. It is at the, from my experience, it's at, it's at the discretion of the chair when a conversation is either about data or other information that is that is um, confidential at the time, or when per perhaps a more productive conversation or a first round of a conversation may, may be more productive if it's held in closed session. I'm wondering if we want to be more specific than discretion of the chair. Hmm. And that, that, I guess, a policy mm -hmm. um, concern, but the... Mm -hmm. We can't talk about being transparent without being transparent. Right. And if we say it's the discretion of the yep. chair, then that's not being transparent. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's, I just wanted to raise that point. Well, what if it's the chair and the administrator? I mean, still not transparent. Yeah, I think, I think what Michelle's mm -hmm. thinking of is some sort of a external standard, like there is, con right. there is personnel matters being discussed, or mm -hmm. there is contracts, negotiations, matters, yeah, matters all that, that are that's subject to a confidentiality that agreement. that we have for our for own. Our own. The statutory yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. requirements. Mm -hmm. I just, I just think that discretion <coughs> can leave people feeling like. Yeah. Right. And, and I'll tell you, for example, um, Equity started fully an open session meeting. Recently, we've gone into closed session with this idea of developing an external fund, right? An external equity fund that the district is not able to fundraise in any way. We also can't be the recipient of funds and have that be a tax deduction for any donors. So this conversation of how can we meet the needs of all of our students um, by developing, n not us, but some other partnership, developing an external equity fund. So that's the, only, that's the reason we've gone into closed session recently for, for the equity department, for the equity committee. But I think, you know, we could, I would say student achievement, it's been survey results, it's been test scores, there's very specific, um, often quantitative data. State statute and look at the listing of uh, matters that fall under mm -hmm. when you can go into mm -hmm. closed session. That would be good guidance, a good place, a good to, start. Good place to start in terms of making the determination as to whether or not mm -hmm. you go into closed session. Because if you're not talking about somebody specifically, then I think the public should not be excluded mm -hmm. from committee mm -hmm. meetings. Mrs. Kennedy, would you say in the past, I mean, I've only been here for almost three years, is this, but who's counting? But who's counting? Um, is this the way committees have, off, have run? Has there any, been anything more specific? No, this board has functioned, um, not this particular board, right. but within Princeton uh, to function as a committee, um, board of, the, of committees. So right. committees are, were generally never open because they were working meetings. And then the results of the working meetings would be shared out with the full board. And any action that's taken, obviously, is in public. Because a committee can't um, act on anything for behalf of the board. Oh, okay. So they're working committees. So originally, those were all closed? Mm-hmm. Oh. Interesting. Interesting. Well, Greg, maybe something to look at in, in policy and change or not change this yeah. to... And, and yeah. just <laughs> along that line, if I can say one thing. Sure. Um, uh, I noticed even in our finance committee this month, I think we have to do a better job of kind of giving an advance um, agenda so people know exactly what we're going to be. I mean, we don't always know exactly what it is, but this, this month, I mean, we go through the, we had a really good meeting with the auditor, and it was just us again. And uh, I think there's probably people in the public who, uh, if they followed us regularly and saw it on the agenda and knew we were going to do it, would, would have come. And I think, so when we are open, I think we have to make sure that we let people know what we're talking about. So we're getting a new website soon. <laughs> Very high hopes for this website. Um, but one thing we had discussed in the past and we're never able to make it happen on the previous websites, where when you click on a committee meeting, you could actually see the agenda for the meeting. So that might be something with the new capability of the website. I agree with you. If Many times as chair, I'll get an email and they'll say, what are you discussing in student achievement? Or is this on the, ca in, on the schedule? People really are engaged and want to know what's being discussed. So perhaps that can be part of the new calendar. That's a great idea. All right. Any other questions or comments before we move on to public forum? Okay, well, today we have a grand total of four speakers on um, our public comment, which is combined agenda and non-agenda items. Um, and so the first one is, is Rod Montgomery. And so 
having a little more time, we'll t stick to our more traditional three-minute uh, limit for each speaker. Um, and we'll just ask for the honor system on, on that, I think. Court curmudgeon taxpayer, uh, speaking in what the positive psychology people term the active destructive mode from a position of hopeful pessimism. Uh, please gavel me down ruthlessly if I go over time or degenerate into incoherent babbling. Uh, the Student Achievement Committee meeting on the 26th of October uh, I share the sentiments of Ms. Kendall of gratitude for the participation of the people from Princeton University. Uh, I didn't quite hear the same thing that Ms. Baglio reported. Uh, I heard the beginning of the conversation about computer science uh, consist of uh, Principal Snyder's report that contrary to previous reports, there he can find uh, space and equipment to support additional sections of introductory Python. The constraining resource at this point is teachers. I also heard the people from Princeton University uh, indicate that their contracts prohibit them from teaching outside the university. So there's no opportunity there for widening the tightest bottleneck for introductory Python. What I heard most of the conversation with the pe people from Princeton uh, to be about was the uh, computer science course sequence in Princeton High School. It is widely considered to be a three-course sequence starting with introductory Python, then moving to a uh, computer programming in Java, object-oriented programming in Java. Each of those is a one-semester course, and then a one-year course uh, computer uh, AP Computer Science A. There is also an Algorithms and Data Structures course that is a follow-up, uh, a follow-on to the Computer Science A, uh, AP course. My understanding is that that was added some years ago uh, to provide uh, something within the high school for the students who had compute com completed uh, AP Computer Science A. But in the course description, in the Pro Princeton High School Program of Studies for the uh, Introduction to Java Programming course, the prerequisite is not the introductory Python course. It is ability to program in at least one computer language. So, uh, there was discussion of uh, the people from Princeton contributing a placement course for placement into the computer science sequence. What I didn't hear is how, other than by passing the intro Python course, Princeton High School currently qualifies students as proficient in at least one programming language to enter the Java sequence. I'm sorry I'm going on too long. My, my general concerns are about, uh, about AP courses in general, district-wide or high school-wide. Uh, it seems to me that that is that general topic is not currently being studied. There was a uh, report from a uh, social science department study that visited Scarsdale 
concerning possible replacement of AP courses with advanced topics courses within the social sciences department. That is not uh, high school wide, doesn't address the high school wide question of uh, students gorging on AP courses and uh, so-called accelerated courses in hope of padding their resumes to support uh, to, to increase their competitiveness in applying for colleges. I, uh, it also doesn't address the concern that board members have expressed that students might be able to uh, shorten, reduce the expense of their college uh, career, uh, undergraduate uh, college career, by getting advanced standing based on AP test results. So I respectfully suggest that the district should address those general uh, questions. The uh, notes I have from the uh, report of the social sciences study committee is that they need to integrate this work with the Princeton High School scheduling changes and so they won't be ready before 2019 to 2020. Okay. With respect specifically to AP Computer Science A, it is a two-year sequence, so it takes twice the teacher resources and twice the space and computer equipment resources of the single course alternative AP computer science principles. This uh, district initiated an AP computer science principles course some years ago Recently, it was stripped of the AP designation. I have not dared to ask why, but I do respectfully suggest that if you are looking for resources to support more introductory Python sections, maybe the place to look is the two-course AP Computer Science a sequence rather than looking for new money, which isn't going to happen, uh, or uh, looking, uh, hoping to divert resources from outside the uh, computer science group. Uh, thank you for your attention. Sorry I ran so far over time, and thank you for your hard work for Princeton students. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Thank you Mr. Montgomery. Just a uh, point of information that the computer science uh, program will be um, reviewed this year, um, and we would welcome your, your input into that review process. Uh, I'd also thank you, Mr. Montgomery, for being such an active participant in so many of our public meetings. We, we always appreciate it. I, I do want to clarify, I didn't mean to say in my, in my comments that the solution was ever to have Princeton University you know, professors teach that to alleviate that. Um, but they did offer to evaluate the placement of students as well as perhaps survey students to see um, what it was that they need. And as Mr. Montgomery also said, the thought was of our four course sequence, should that really be three courses at the high school? So it was an interesting discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next is uh, Mr. Perry. Hi there, I'm Ralph Perry, you know me already, and I don't have a handout today. Um, and I want to digress for a minute for what I wanted to say, because Sam was talking about the famous or infamous six-minute charge through the corridors of the high school to get to the next class. And all I can think about is that when I went from grade one to grade eight, when I showed up in class on day one, they showed me a chair and a desk, and I sat there for the next year. Nobody charged through the corridors, and why can't you do that here? I don't know. The teachers are 
about, I don't know how many teachers in the high school, 80 or 100 teachers against 1,600 students running around can make a difference. I realize there are computer labs, there are chemical labs and things like that, which you can't have in every class and you gotta move. But a good majority of the students are sitting there and they don't have to run, and that's it. Uh, the reason I'm not handing anything out because you can all read it tomorrow in Town Topics, what I'm gonna say, because I have a letter to the editor. And I really wanted to thank the committee and everybody here that worked for the last 20 months on this horrendous thing called the referendum. Um, and uh, you guys did a hell of a job, but you were missing input from the public until six months ago. The first 14 months was kind of an inside club. Uh, and as far as I'm concerned, we start from scratch right now. We don't sit back. There is nothing on this agenda here today about the referendum. Uh, the referendum is very much alive, and I'm not talking about December. I'm talking about November of next year. Uh, and we and you got to go and start from scratch to do it. Uh, and there are, in my book, two major points that you have to address and address them now. One, there has to be a new demographic study. We really don't know how many students are gonna be here in four or five years. The old demographics are already per se. The other one is the question of committees. And you just were talking about committees with closed session, committees with open session. I'm talking about committees where a member of the public that will be volunteering, if you just go out and ask them to volunteer, to come and be like a member of the committee and represent the public. And those people uh, could be appointed by the mayor of Princeton, or they can come out here and volunteer if you just ask them. Just ask them. There's a lot of people in Princeton that are pretty smart, would like to do that. I mean, uh, you need public input. And don't wait until the next board is going to sit down in session because the only truth about the next board is that there's gonna be at least one new member. We don't know if there's gonna be any more than one new member or three new members. But that is not the whole board. You gotta start doing it now. Don't wait, don't waste the next two months. At least design the committees, what you wanna have them to do. Uh, and the committees can be glued, so to speak, to the projects that you have approval from Trenton of doing. Now, some of these projects will disappear by December because if the referendum for the $27 million will go through, there are some of the projects in there that will have to be re reassessed or something like that. Uh, and the last thing, thing I want to say, uh, that I watched the presentation of Mr. Sullivan and Daphna on TV30 and uh, Mr. Sullivan was very proud when he mentioned what the school is really doing that he did not get in high school, the new courses. And he was talking about the students are getting a course which is called teamwork. They learn how to work in teams. Well, you gotta show them the example, how to work in teams and not just the board, but the people from outside the board. And that's, that's basically it. And if you wanna get a slightly different opinion of what Mr. Sullivan said, you can watch two of my friends and myself tomorrow night at 8.30 on TV 30. Uh, we are going to be there, this is a free commercial. Uh, we are gonna be there and answering the same questions 
that were posed to Mr. Sullivan, almost the same question, and to Daphna. Thank you very much for giving me the time. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Berry. And uh, next is Mary Clerman. Thank you. I'm actually going to follow up a bit on what Ralph said, um, but I'd like to say first that I really appreciated the night's meeting. I, I don't know whether I haven't paid sufficient attention at previous meetings, but this seemed very productive. And I like the open contributions of everybody. Uh, it was very informative. I like the fact that you announced the different committees that, uh, and the times and the dates that they're going to meet. That I guess I'll have to make, make it to some of them. The board has made a courageous shift in splitting the request for funding into two parts and focusing first on critical fixes. We're all relieved to, to know that mold, temperature extremes, and general infrastructure needs will now be addressed. Our further request, this is follows up on Ralph's request, is that the broader community be included in the processes that lead to these resolutions. Specifically, we urge that the need for a citizen advisory process, not just a committee, but a process, be addressed now, well before work begins and even before the actual initial referendum, as Ralph says, so that voters can see that alternatives will be researched, discussed openly, and narrowed down for the best possible outcomes. It's really, really important for people to understand that you have checked what the possibilities are, not just chosen a particular path because it seemed to work. I'd say this mindful of the limitations of board expertise and of the record of decisions <coughs> by past boards regarding, for example, not only the PAC, but also the ina inadequate window replacements at PHS, a likely contributor to mold. As for the structure of such a committee, I suggest a volunteer working group of the board's facilities committee and residents who are expert in construction and maintenance, meaning, for instance, facilities management, and that their progress be monitored publicly in periodic open presentations of proposed solutions that keep voters informed and reassured of the transparency of decisions. And I've made copies of this in case you want to follow up on it. Thank you, Mary. And, and last is Kip Cherry. Good evening. I'm Kip Cherry. I'm one of the guilty parties with Ralph. And I, I do hope you'll watch our show. It was pretty fast moving, I can tell you. We didn't really need Joan to uh, tell us to speak. We all had so much to say that we just moved the ball around really quickly. Uh, I want to review, um, and I also agree with the idea of opening up your committees to more uh, public involvement, uh, public participation, so I encourage you along those lines. And I wanted to uh, review some of the comments I made um, yesterday to the Facilities Committee. Uh, I, and I appreciated very much the positive uh, response uh, from members of the Facilities Committee, and I'm actually following along with some of the uh, thoughts that Ralph and Mary both have um, expressed. Uh, so several weeks ago when uh, Pat Sullivan um, uh, went on to announce that we were just going with one referendum to start, he mentioned organizing stakeholder groups to help guide future planning. Stakeholder groups typically are made up of facility users such as faculty, students, and the public. I believe that we need a stakeholder group to be formed now to work on determining how to implement the projects included in the referendum and an advisory group of local volunteer experts for each component of the referendum, security, HVAC, classroom design, and athletic fields. I'm really saying what Ralph said, too, in my own words, and I can tell you we didn't discuss it at all. This is all, you know, <laughs> extemporaneous. I think it is important to announce now that you are forming these groups and to begin to solicit candidates who might be interested. You could even put an ad into Town Topics if you wanted to. This process will take some time, so I think it is important to start now to get the names of interested people and what expertise they bring. Insofar as the stakeholders, their expertise is simply the fact that they will be a space user, including the parents of users and taxpayers at large. Their first task might be to figure out what attributes they want from the various components of the, of the referendum, security, HVAC, et cetera. 
The advisory committees, in my view, should be set up to develop overall design and operational goals for each component of the referendum, looking at feasibility, sustainability, quality, and cost effectiveness. So the, the notion of these advisory uh, committees is that they're an arm of you, basically, but they have expertise that you don't have, that none, none of us has all the expertise we need. Uh, and um, uh, from this, there uh, would emerge uh, a building program, I'm back to that again, and a narrative with detailed cost estimates that fit within the budget created by the referendum, and that describe each project in detail, becoming the basis for the detailed design. This still hasn't been done yet, and I, I think that we would really benefit if you started, uh, put down on paper a, a building program for each component of the referendum. In considering security, for instance, goals might be uh, to maintain a sense of transparency and openness, integrating these designs as seamlessly as possible into our existing buildings. Or you might have a totally different set of goals. This is the set of goals that I would be contributing in a committee discussion. Similarly, it is important to evaluate alternative HVAC systems, including solar and geothermal systems, heat pumps, high efficiency systems, et cetera, so that the advisory committee can recommend the most sustainable and cost-effective systems to the Board of, um, of Education. We also need to consider other alternatives, such as adding small additions to existing elementary schools versus considering a new 5-6 school, and how this will impact system design. One advantage of the small additions approach is that if additions and enrollment don't materialize as projected, PPS can and should adjust the timing and sizes of the small additions that are constructed. So rather than going with a 5-6 school, you would go with a number of small additions. And I know a lot of people think there isn't enough room and all that sort of thing, but uh, we've all looked at the sites and we think that there is. So that would be another approach. Uh, and one more uh, positive thing from that is that you don't have the um, large addition and operating expenses that you would with a 5-6 school. And you all know that our levy situation is extremely tight. I was asked yesterday what kinds of people might have expertise to donate as volunteers. Here are just a few suggestions for the HVAC committee. For instance, uh, somebody who's an HVAC designer who lives right here in Princeton willing to volunteer their time, an electrical, geotechnical, or environmental engineer, a sustainable design advocate, an HVAC installer, an HVAC repair person, or even a homeowner who just installed a system in their home after um, making an exhaustive study of the alternatives. These people all have a tremendous amount of expertise to bring to this. Finally, I would like to suggest some pretty immediate administrative solutions, particularly for PHS. Some of these you've heard before, but I'm going to repeat them again. Things that are pretty easy to do immediately and pretty inexpensive. So I'll mention the two settings for the cafeteria again. I still think that's a really um, important idea. A portable cafe that could be set up at strategic locations and just moved around. Opening skylights that have been shut. Adding murals and LED lighting in hallways that are dim. Funds for these activities, if not in the budget, could be funded by a variety of fundraising activities. At the last BOE meeting, Scott Downey was asked to describe upcoming public participation in implementing the referendum. Basically, what he said was that there would be the usual level of participation, public participation. I would hope to see us go much farther than usual, and I hope that we can move forward quickly to solicit names of interested people for each of these committees that I just mentioned. I would also support the idea of a Citizens Finance Committee to look over um, PPS's operating budget. That's something that the community has used, the municipality, and I think you would benefit from that. We all would. And finally, I commend you again on your decision uh, to go with just the first ref referendum and let, um, let the, the, the cards fall where they may as we move forward. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Kip. You. <clears throat> okay. Um, I think now things might move. A little more quickly in our in our agenda, we all thought it would be a fast meeting, and <coughs> not that fast of a meeting, but we've had a great conversation tonight, so it's worth it. Um, but we're going to move on now to uh, item J, and these again, most of these are consent items. So um, J is actually actions, right? So um, J two is action, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, so J two and J three. So, um, and J1 is no action, so with that, I guess we need a motion for J2. Greg, and second, Beth. 
<coughs> Greg and Beth. Uh, any questions or comments on the second uh, on J two the second reading items? Yep. Do a quick quick intro for so J one is the no action, and I think the the board has seen the. Uh, 18 policies that are up for first reading. And I want to just thank um, uh, Stephanie for sending it to the rest of Finance Committee, uh, the, the ones that especially impact on, on budgeting. And so we really appreciated the input on that and the input of everyone else. Uh, so that was just a quick intro on, on those 18 policies that are up for first reading. And for the public, those policies are all under the th 3000 series, which is business and non-instructional operations. One very quick note for the public and for the board, uh, the only substantive changes that the policy committee made um, to what was given to us by the New Jersey School Boards Association was in policy 3327, its relations with vendors, and, and that the uh, suggestion uh, that was made was to add a statement of the board's aspirations uh, when dealing with vendors, outside vendors, and that is a, a very simple one-line sentence that says the board shall endeavor to seek diversity in its vendor pool. So we recommend, uh, you know, the board to, to consider that. So that's it as in terms of the, the first reading. I know there was a question on the second reading on policy 1312, and so uh, Daphne and Betsy had some alternative language to suggest. So I wanted to ask them about that. Thank you. Thanks, Greg, and thanks to the whole policy committee. Um, on 1312, there's one line. Um, so the, creating a chain of communications, I think, is really important to all of us. We talk about this in personnel, in student achievement, what you're talking about in policy, that when someone brings something to our attention, we want the community to know that they are heard and that they're... Um, you know, and, and, and that we're looking into things. The question is what a board member is saying and doing when they receive that information. So the, the sentence that I was looking at is where it says the board member will withhold comment, commitment, and or opinion, and as appropriate, inform the superintendent of the issue. My feeling was twofold. One is that it's difficult to withhold comment. I think we have to think about what an appropriate comment might be. Thank you for bringing this to our attention. I'm sorry this was your experience. But certainly commitment to any outcome or, or their own opinion is certainly appropriate. Um, and then it says, as appropriate, inform the superintendent. I think it's our responsibility to always inform the superintendent. If, if something is brought to our attention, the superintendent is the only person that we're able to inform. So again, if it says, as appropriate, I'm wondering if the community will feel like, well, if that board member doesn't think it's important, they won't inform anyone. And so that I just put that forward before all of you for your consideration. And so the suggestion is to to uh, the change that line to say the board member will will withhold judgment and will inform the superintendent of the issue. And and this is uh, for for the public. This is under community complaints and inquiries. I guess. What does the code of ethics say? When we when we have the code of ethics, we we're we're sworn to follow the chain of command. What's the verbiage in the code of ethics? I'll look that up. Yeah, I do. Oh. It's, um, <coughs> I will recognize that authority rests of the Board of Education will make no personal promises nor take any private action that may compromise the board. And then. Um, I will refer all complaints, this is Jay, the last item of our, our code of ethics. I will refer all complaints to the chief administrative officer, our superintendent, and will act on the complaints at public meetings only after failure of an administrative solution. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so I, I so think the, the language. Combination of, like mm -hmm. some verbiage that's a combination that, right. that follows our code of ethics, mm -hmm. uh, but our policy should be in line with our code of ethics. Right. I agree. Right, and I agree, I agree I, a little more than Betsy. Um, I think the policy is a little Orwellian in, you know, restricting our speech. And I looked at the statutory authority. It doesn't seem like any, it's it's not mandatory. So I'm just wondering why we would want to do that. Actually, that, thanks for pointing that out. Mm -hmm. That was a mistake on our part. Uh, it's marked other reasons, but it also should be marked monitored. It was on our um, oh. Uh, on our spreadsheet, so uh, that was so it should be both monitored and other reasons okay. as well. But there's no. But I'm just wondering why you're suggesting it because there's no statutory. Like it goes beyond, far beyond the code of ethics, and in a community 
like the one that we live in, um, I think it's um, an unreasonable standard as an elected official to uh, be hamstrung that way. What part of what part of it is unreasonable? Well, not to comment, um, withhold judgment. I mean, is that judgment like my own judgment or verbal judgment or like? I, I assume that to be if someone brought you a complaint about a staff member. Mm -hmm. As a board member, you're not saying, I totally agree. Let's bring this to the superintendent. You're mm -hmm. sort of saying thank you for mm -hmm. hey, comment. Betsy, mm -hmm. Can I yes. throw out a, a real world? And this is one Gary and I have talked about a number of times. Houses on Moore Street, people I know. Bill, that alarm, 3 in the morning, it goes off. It goes for 20 minutes. I can't go back to sleep, and then I have to get up for work. That's interesting. <laughs> No, okay, okay, um, okay um, right? So you yeah. say, have you, have you emailed, so then you begin with the chain of command. Have you emailed the school? Have you emailed, you know, so you start with the chain of command. You begin with the chain of command. You don't say nothing, but you also, you cannot, you've taken a, you've taken an oath, you cannot promise anything. We are one of nine. We cannot speak for the board. We cannot take action as an individual. And this policy indoctrinizes us and protects us and keeps us out of litigation. I don't want to be indoctrinated. Well, that's too bad. You took an oath. Right. Yeah, and but right, yeah. and you will get us in trouble but if you I, I, make promises that we as well, a board don't so want to keep. But to be a nice person, yes. to be a nice person, the other the other nice thing to say is to your to your friend is, are you asking me as a friend or as a board member? So as a friend, I would say, have you emailed Gary? Does Gary know? Does Gary Wiseman know? Can you email Steve? What would you like me to do about it? Are you, what, and that, I would ask them face to face, what would you like me to do about it? Email Steve and copy me. That's a good idea. But I would probably because say. Because it takes you out of, because you can't promise them you will do anything. Well, it's not, a, it's, you're not really making a promise, you're saying, let me see. Uh, know, uh, when uh, I see uh, Gary you, at facilities, let me ask him. And we've had discussions and he says. That's inappropriate. You know, I, it's very, very I, I don't think so. I've looked it at the statute. In trouble. I've looked at the statute, and it doesn't address this. This this sentence here, I can't find any statutory basis mm -hmm. for it. I've looked at the statutory language listed down below, and I can't find it. it it's a great. It's very, very nice of you. I, I, I would take out. The board member will inform the superintendent of the issue as appropriate, or something like that. You know, I'm not. I wouldn't make a promise i would say will not will withhold making a promise look we don't need to be emailing steve about bike racks at the high school that's a gary problem not a steve problem yeah, but, but we, these are these are the people you see at baseball right. games at football games yeah. at track meets right, but they at, don't need the to be attacking shop. us as board members we have board members yeah but they're going to ask the questions anyway no, but things. but also as a no, board member yeah. we communicate with steve so I have emailed, unfortunately, Steve, many times with saying something just FYI, this was, you know, but we don't direct other staff. So I'm not, I'm not directing other staff. Do you realize we're draining him by telling him about so little what, things what that you, we Greg, need to tell them where to go come, through the who, chain of command? Where did this language come from? Sure, let, let me give you yeah. the, the little the bit of the context, and, and that might help as well. I mean, this is from uh, New Jersey School Boards yep. Association, but it's also based on the training. And so, you know, Daphne, you've had three years already of, of, mm -hmm. of being a board member, and Bill, you've had two. But we're going to have a, a new board member coming on who won't even have the, the training for the first couple of months of, of, of being on the board. So I think our policy manager Annual is 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 really our our you know as 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 Evelyn is saying it's it's our rules and regulations is what we hold not only ourselves but letting the public know what our roles are vis-a-vis -vis everyone else working here at the district and I think it's really important so the background of this is <coughs> actually uh, the New Jersey School Boards Association not only what's in statute but also what's in the training so uh, our first year training manual you know has has. A, a section on effective board governments where they ask what is the chain of command and the relationship between the board and the superintendent and in that training and, and, and someone do, doesn't get it for the first few months and may not get it for a while which is why it's so important for us to have it in policy as well it said is 
The function of the school board is not to run the schools, but to see that they are run effectively. Our superintendent is the educational leader, the one who translates the will of the board into administrative action. So the superintendent's accountable to the board. All other staff members are accountable to the superintendent. Uh, um, the board, both individually and collectively, will promptly refer all criticism, complaints, and suggestions concerning its schools, its programs or operation, or its employees to the superintendent for study, review, and recommendation to it. So I think the, the idea behind this is, is really to, to, to allow the public to know what the chain of command is. And, and I think that's really, really important because otherwise, you know, we're not doing a service to our public by not making it very, very clear. So um, what we tried to do, because this has been brought up before and we had a very robust discussion about it last time, is, is to uh, modify the language a little bit, uh, hearing the sort of response of everybody. And we're trying to get to a compromise that, that makes it crystal clear to the public where the chain of command is, but also says that, thanks, um, you know, uh, Bill, you're right. I mean, if something happens in the middle of the night, of course you're going to act. But no, no, it's not a matter of it. They call me in the middle. In the middle of the night, just walk, walking around town, you run into them, they say, that alarm's driving me crazy. Actually, it, it all came because we were dealing with the lights at the fields, and they said they had a list of complaints. And I said, well, put it together. Right now, we're meeting on it. We can share it. This is the time to bring it up. And so it's not they're calling at 3 in the morning. But that's not a judgment. But yeah. I think, yeah, I think that maybe the words that people, and there's, many, many lawyers on this board, so I'm sure you all know what I'm thinking, but it's, it's not so much the, the, comment, uh, the comment commitment and or opinion. It, it seems like what they're getting at is you, you don't want a board member to admit liability, right? So they hear a fact pattern or one side of a, of a, of a fact pattern. They don't, you wouldn't want the board member to say, oh, well, we've done that, you know, this is the 10th time I've heard about something like this, or this is part of a pattern, or, um, gee, that, you know, I know that teacher and he's probably guilty, mm -hmm. or, you know what I mean, <laughs> or, or we, this happens all the time. Things that would implicate the board, that would get that board member <coughs> in a deposition, ultimately, if it goes to a law, whatever the situation, it goes to a lawsuit, and, you know, Bill, isn't it true that you said that, you know, this always happens, or something like that, you know, right? So it's not that you can't say, well, gee, that sounds terrible, we, you know, I want to help you look into this. You know, there's things that you can say that won't, and we most we all know this. But you know, I, I think this policy is maybe a little broad. You, because of course you're going to comment. You're not going to say nothing when so, you know something happens to a child, God forbid, or a parent comes to you with a child issue. You're not going to say that it's not doesn't sound terrible, right? But <laughs> right. you know, sorry to, sorry to hear that. I mean, that's fine. But if you say, yeah, you know. Opinion. That's an opinion as opposed to, well, clearly we must have done something wrong here. That, so I'm sure that's what this policy is aiming at, but it seems a little broad to me, right? Yeah, it seems like the, the, the terminology could be played with a bit. And I, for what, when the board is confronted with an issue, the board member will direct the complainant. So not everybody is complaining. Like one person saying to me, oh, the school buses are run empty. Working with Stephanie enough, I learned that we have to reserve spots for every child on that route and we can't we can't you can't do it like an airline where you overbook so unless everybody that is on that route is on the bus it will not be a hundred percent of capacity so then you can explain that to a member you know someone who's voting for us and asking us questions or voting against us and asking us questions but so they're not necessarily complaining they're just we're just explaining facts to them or if it's the alarm, then you know, Gary gave me some really good explanations of why it's going to keep going off until the police come there and turn it off. So it's, I guess it's trying to figure out how to tighten up the language so that, because I know I'll violate that, <laughs> and I don't want to violate it knowingly, but I will. So it's got to be written so that when we're doing what we will do, living in a small town and talking to everybody, that we're not going to get in trouble. Otherwise, I'll be in handcuffs and deposed. And so do we want to give it back to policy and let them have another run at it and see what we think? Is that, is you guys okay with that? I, I, I think that the challenge is, because I've, I've always felt like the intent of the school board's association was to muzzle everybody and, and to make sure that we did not speak. Uh, except for when we're sitting in this public forum and, and we speak collectively. That's just not realistic. And, and secondly, the expectation of voters is that 
I pulled a lever from you. So if I want to stop you in the produce section and ask you a question, <laughs> I expect you to answer that question. So, so, so somewhere in there, in that spectrum of don't say a word and spill your guts, <laughs> there's, there's got to be a, a safe space that allows us to, to respond in a way that doesn't make us look like morons or that we're not being responsive, but also respects the chain of command. Can I just say ditto what to everything Michelle said? Yeah. <laughs> What language would you suggest then? Because I think that's what we're all going for. I, I think we need Policy? to take it yeah, back to I committee so and kick okay. it around a little yeah. bit and Thank see you. what we can come up with that, yeah. that so that we can be responsive people, but again, not get ourselves in trouble and not get this board and in trouble. I think we can do that. I, I think the intent was to, to we, want it, we want what this says to allow us to be responsive and respectful and receive information in a way that's humane and um, appropriate. So I, I think there's just a little bit more work to be done, but I th think, I mean, certainly the intention is not to, at least our intention as a policy committee was not to muzzle anybody, but to really to, um, to put us in a position to be able to share information, because that's, I mean, I think we all feel that responsibility to do that, um, but to do it, in, and, but, but this policy is about complaints and inquiries, so I think it, we need to set ourselves up to be able to, um, <coughs> to, to receive the complaints and, um, and to educate about the chain of command. Mm -hmm. So I think with a little okay. more, we can do that. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. We'll, we'll take it back. And we're meeting on Friday, so we'll continue the discussion. <laughs> Come back for a third round. Thank you, Greg. Okay. <laughs> sure. So uh, we're going to table that yeah. one. Okay. And the. Okay. <laughs> okay. Right. Okay. So you'll just do that in editing after the yeah. fact. Okay. Um, and before we go to the third, to the to number three, the second reading policies. Um, we're going to table one three one two. Yep. We're just going to table one three one two. Yep. But that. But now we need to. Do, should we move on to the vote to section? Up, though, for yeah, one three one two. I'm trying. I'm trying to. Um, do you want us all to abstain? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, uh, let me refresh it. I think I refresh it. Okay. Let's see what that's like. The produce section was a good example. Like, if we all said, how many people have come to the produce section? Yeah, okay, so it's table. So, yeah. Honey, I'm sorry, I just want Right. Or small world. Or right. a car ticket. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there should be a fund. There should be a fund for our tickets. Our tickets. <laughs> Greg. Yeah. Greg and Beth moved it. <coughs> okay, so now it says, um, so four. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, so while you're doing that, um, can we have a, can I get a motion for number three? Or is it too late, too early for that? No, we're good. I'm good. Okay, good. So motion, Greg, and a second. Beth, again, this is for um, uh, J3. These are also, this is also a, a series of second reading policies. And this is the entire 2000 series. Hold on a second, excuse me. I just want to clarify that that was uh, everybody was voted unanimous to table that. Yes. Okay. So nobody th thinks it's going through. Okay. Any questions on the J3 policies? Is your mic on? Is uh, the 2000 policies is administration? So we worked extremely ex extra closely with our business administrator on this one. We had no comments after the first reading uh, from anybody, and so we, we sent it back out to everybody. For, and this is for second reading, and this was to take the entire 2000 uh, and, and trans transition it over.
as a yank. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Apologies. You might have to refresh a little. Where are you looking? It's right. It's um. Sorry, it's not <coughs> Maybe. Yeah, maybe it's not there. So. It's hosted up on board docs. Eventually, when the new website comes in, they'll link back and forth, but right now it's not a good link. Is this what you're looking for? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So. All votes are in, right? Mm -hmm. yes, okay, so now we move to um, item K. We need a, a motion and a second for K1. Betsy and a second. Uh, sorry. sorry. Motion and a second for K1. Motion is Betsy and second is Debbie. Uh, any questions or comments on K1? Lou has, a, Lou has one. Yeah. Uh, on the uh, list of retirees, uh, <laughs> Sorry, yes. we have very, very uh, important retirement, and that's Gwen Kempsel. She's been here for 32 years, and she's beating me by a month to retirement. Uh, Gwen has been a student assistant counselor and uh, peer group leader at uh, PHS for uh, 32 years, as I said. She uh, came to us from West Windsor, Plainsboro. She served in a similar capacity there. Uh, she taught at Mass One High School, and she served as a substance abuse counselor at the College of New Jersey. She graduated Westchester and then Trenton State, where she earned her master's degree in counseling. Gwen has been a very valuable resource to students, to our parents, to our staff, and our community over her many years in the district, and she's a very compassionate and understanding person and counselor. Her peer group programs and her big brother, big sisters programs are excellent model programs that have benefited a multitude of students over the years. Her unique perspective and desire to help all students, making sure there's access by all students across all lines of diversity, whether it be racial or economic, has been truly exemplary and has been a model to follow as she has given her time and her out-of-school out of uh, time to connect students with the necessary resources to be successful. She has served as the SAD advisor, which is the Students Against Drunk Driving. She's provided individual group and crisis <coughs> counseling and interventions to numerous students and their families. And she served on and established numerous committees regarding student wellness and health. In her quiet way, she has left a big footprint and will be missed. On a personal note, I had a chance to talk with her, and uh, I know that she is the mother uh, of a bride-to-be pretty soon. Her daughter Rebecca is getting married soon. And the reason I mention Rebecca is because she works at the Educational Testing Service and uh, where my daughter Emily works at Educational Testing Service. And they both have conspired to uh, research and write the verbal portion of the SATs that uh, many students take throughout the uh, state of New Jersey and in the nation. Uh, and no, I don't know any of the answers yeah. because I probably <laughs> couldn't get any of them right anyway. But they've done a wonderful job, and on a personal note, I, I wish uh, Rebecca well, and also Gwen well as she moves on to the next stage and challenges of her life with gratitude for the work that she has done during her years in the district and as she enters the true PPS stage, not Princeton Public Schools, but post-Princeton stage of her life. Hmm. I have just trademarked it right <laughs> yeah. now. Thank you very much. Post Princeton stage for all retirees. So thank you very much, Gwen Kimsel. Thank you for everything you've done. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And there is it. I, I don't think we didn't have any other comments on retirees, so we'll just move along. I just, oh, is there more? I just, yeah. I just have yeah. one. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> it's a. It's. <laughs> Um, it, it's, it's sort of a sad irony because um, Lou is the one who always speaks on behalf of the retirees at every meeting, and um, he, he may want to speak on behalf of himself um, tonight, um, but um, I'm going to beat you to the punch, um, and there may be others to follow. Um, this is a bittersweet moment um, for me and I think for many of the people around the table. Um, it was, was not a letter of uh, retirement that I was um, looking forward to receiving. Lou has been um, 
an incredible source of counsel to me personally and to many superintendents in his 19 years here in the district. Um, he's also been an incredible friend. Um, and so on a, on a professional level and on a personal level, it's going to be hard to, um, to not have him here on a daily basis. Um, here are things you don't know about Lou. <laughs> And I have to confess that every time I talk to Lou, and this is often he'll wander down to my office late in the afternoon, the evening when everyone's gone, and every time I talk to him, I find out something new. So things you don't know about Lou. He performs stand-up comedy in New York City. He has an HBO award-winning documentary. Um, he... He loves jazz, goes faithfully to New Orleans. He loves the Mets. He's there every opening day. Yeah. <laughs> he, um, he swims regularly um, when he's not suffering from a concussion from bumping into the side of the pool yet again. Um, so he's... <laughs> He's got a remarkable set of skills outside of his role as assistant superintendent for human resources. But inside that role, um, there is no one more knowledgeable or masterful in his craft, um, whether it's uh, hiring teachers or administrators or mediation, mediating issues among, um, among personnel, whether it's uh, negotiating. Um, he... He, he's truly remarkable. Um, so there is, um, he, he, he's leaving a legacy. Um, and I'm, because it's Lou, I'm going to take a moment and, and read some of what he's leaving to us um, as part of that legacy. He's established a nationally recognized seven-year mentoring and induction program. He's established the first mentoring program in the nation for our support staff. He established the Sick Leave Bank for employees who suffer catastrophic or life-threatening illness. He has chaired 82 search committees for administrative staff. He's participated as the chief nego negotiator or on the board's negotiating team for 18 collective bargaining contracts for teachers, administrators, and support staff. He's established the process and procedures we now use for the annual personnel committee review of staff for tenure and reappointment. He served as the advisor to the Tower newspaper in the school year 2003-2004 because he started his career as a journalist. Um, he established the work-study program that you talked about tonight um, of Princeton University for university students to tutor high school students in the Idea Center at PHS. That was Lou. He served on committees to establish the preschool, the preschool disabilities program, expansion of the autism program, establishment of the bridges program at PHS. He chaired the 14-month rewrite of the athletic EPS, EPES stipend committee in 2005 and the most recent 2018 rewrite of that uh, stipend committee. He co-created CJ Pride, a group of human resource professionals around the, the state dedicated to increasing diversity in the teaching ranks. And his participating districts have grown from the original three in 2002 to 23 and growing in 2018. Princeton has hosted that CJ Pride job fair 12 out of the 17 times it's been held, increasing the attendance to more than... Um, 500. He's worked with the administrators and the board um, to increase the diversity of staff through the hiring and retention of teachers, administrators, and support staff over the years. In the past two years, as this board knows, more than 40% of our hires have been educators of color. Lou was instrumental in that shift and initiated last year a week-long tour of recruitment fairs at historically black colleges and universities throughout the Mid-Atlantic and the South, a tour that I seem to recall ended in New Orleans. Um, <laughs> working, with, <laughs> working with the Princeton Ed Foundation, he created the Walnut Film Festival. No surprise now that you know that he was an HBO award-winning director, um, which screened short films in May each year at the Garden Theater on Nassau Street from student filmmakers from John Witherspoon Middle School and Princeton High School. 
Um, he served as the host of the TV, TV cable show This Week in Education, highlighting persons and programs in the Princeton schools. He taped over 130 live streamed shows um, that were live streamed either to the Princeton TV viewer base of 75,000 families and surrounding areas and 30 million Apple viewers and 20 million Roku viewers. Um, he served as the district's emergency management coordinator for over a dozen years, established greater security pro protocols for students and staff, participated in over 200 <laughs> 250 closed session meetings and open public meetings of the board. Um, uh, count those hours, uh, you'll never get those back. <laughs> um, at over 200 personnel committee meetings of the personnel committee of the board, working in almost 100, uh, working with almost 100 board members during this time, chaired the committee comprised of administrators and teaching staff, which created the APP, the Alternative Professional Project for effectively and highly effective teaching staff. Um, Served as mentor to supervisors, assistant principals, principals statewide through the Principal and Supervisors Association program since its initial inception. Um, he began implementation of a five-year communication strategic plan um, after an outside communications audit was completed in 2017. Initiated the groundwork for the establishment of our new alumni fairs initiative to connect current students with alumni and for alumni to connect with each other. He had the good fortune to work with an excellent human resources staff, dedicated administrators, teachers, support staff, board members, and parents who wanted to be involved in making this district great um, and always better. And um, finally, he, um, he ensured that there was a sufficient supply of M&Ms in the human resource office. Um, so those are uh, the professional legacy, um, but the legacy is really about people. And you hear it in his words about everyone who retires. Um, you hear it in his interactions with staff as he walks through the hallway. There are 800 employees in this district. Lou knows them all. Um, he knows their families. He knows their histories. He knows the struggles they're dealing with. Um, and he's someone that people go to um, when they need advice um, when they're having troubles, and he finds a compassionate way to deal with them all. Lou has said to me, Steve, the little things are the big things. It's the asking about someone's family. Um, and he has done that, and he has left a legacy of, um, of care for this school district um, that I only hope that we can continue to bring forward, Lou. Um, this will not be my last time to talk about you. Um, <laughs> so I'll refine my comments in, in the future because there are a few other things that, um, that people don't know about Lou that I avoided saying on live TV. Um, but I, I wanted to know, I want you to know how much um, all of us appreciate so much of what you've done. Um, and there'll be impossible shoes to fill, but we know that you are looking forward to spending time with your wife and your, um, your kids and your grandkids. Um, and so we, we thank you for everything that you have done, um, for the hundreds and hundreds of people you have hired and, and, and brought into this district and supported, um, and we, uh, we wish you well in the future. Can I say something very Sure, quickly? I don't know if you can beat that. I but, can, uh, yeah. I won't even try. Okay. But I will say that um, I've been on the personnel committee since joining the board, and I appreciate the way you help new board members learn the ropes, and I, I have, I've learned quite a bit. But I'll also say what I really appreciate is that you connect us to the teachers. So Lou invites board members to retirement parties. Yeah. He invites us to mentor sessions. The first month of school at Conti is when the mentors and the new teachers are together in the last month of the school year. <clears throat> and I love it as a former teacher, and I love to see how proud you are of all the people and all the connections that have been made. So I thank you for connecting us to what really matters, which is the, which is the teachers who work with our students. So thanks a lot. I'll go next. Okay. I'm sure we'll all, we'll, we will all say something. So Lou... Uh, We'll miss you. Um, as a Mets fan, I know 
your true character, and uh, I respect that. And um, yeah, I hope this is uh, not goodbye. Okay, um, I've been on personnel for two years and the committee leader this year, and I've really enjoyed our meetings where we talk about a lot, and then I'm like, okay, we got to do the personnel stuff, you know, <laughs> move on to that. But I, I love your room because you do know every teacher. I'll be like, okay, who's the third grade teacher here? And you're like, blah, 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 and, and you have so much history about everybody, and, and you'll go way back in years, and you'll say, oh, yeah, that one started, and they had like one kid, and they lived here, and now they're here. So the information you have on people is just, it is very touching because you're right, it is the people. <laughs> yeah. I know, I know, maybe. All of us too, but I have really enjoyed learning from you, so, and I wish you lots of luck. Well, I'll just say, Lou, since um, I just realized that that you and I have been on, in these board meetings for a third of your total career. Wow. <laughs> so, um, yeah, not that I'm counting. But, um, and we're both retiring at the same time, so that may, maybe tells you something. But, but it's been just a pleasure working with you. Such a consummate professional. And I'm, uh, we'll, as Steve said, we'll say more later. I'm sure there'll be other venues um, to, to roast you or, or toast you, whatever the case may be. But um, I will just say now that, that, that Lou is a guy you do not want to play poker with because, <laughs> he's, <laughs> because he'll never know that he's got four aces until he puts them on the table. Yeah. And that's the way he, he does things, very low-key, but he always has his facts and he's always completely informed and he knows his plans. So um, very, uh, it's been a great honor to work with you and really you know, hope, wish you all the best in your future endeavors. Um, with the background, I didn't know you did all those things. It's pretty cool, but I'm sure you've got a great, you know, plan for yourself av after this, which is going to be just fantastic. So, wish you all the best, Lou. I just want to say that you took the time to go to all those HBCUs and start a tradition that I think is very important. Um, I'm all about diversity. I don't think it's any secret that people know I'm all about diversity and all about equity. And I know that you have to want to do it. It has to be intentional. And your trip down south to all those HBCUs to meet those folks who you never knew, and they were probably like, what the heck is this guy doing from Princeton, New Jersey, coming to see us? But you met with them, you broke bread with them, you developed relationships, and that's why we've improved our hiring of teachers of color, and that's going to make a difference to the kids of color who don't see anybody in their classroom or their school that looks like them. And for that, I thank you. I thank you for your commitment. I thank you for being intentional. And I thank you for caring enough to go the extra mile to make that happen. Thank you. Thank you. OK. So, um we have, I think the still have to come back to the board meeting next month, however. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah right. <laughs> so there'll be a, a whole other round of um, you know, speeches. But, um, and I, bring a stand-up routine, yeah. actually. Yeah, that's yeah, what yeah. we all would like to do. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I think one, one – so thanks again, Lou. But w one question on K-1, Stephanie. I, I thought that we – I'm not sure if you just did this by editing, but on uh, the EPES attachment, we were going to table 77 through 82. You were going to do that? Yeah. Hold on one second. Okay. That because it was just a portion. Yeah, it was only number 77 through 82 on one attachment in K1. So we just need to memorialize that, I think. Eighty-two, right? Okay. All right, and now um, has everyone voted on K one yet? As amended. <coughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm sorry. We were removing. Right, right, right. So can, as vote? amended. You can vote now. Yeah, yeah. as amended.
they need to vote again? No. Okay. It says up at the top, section EPS numbers, table section EPS number 738. I'll clean it up when it's finished, okay. but that's Great. what you guys are doing. Okay. Are we ready for K2? Okay. Motion. I'm moving the table until it, until it speaks to equity. Okay. Is a second for that? Mm -hmm. Daphne Thank you. 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 Thank I guess while you're doing that, I, I would just suggest too, if it speaks, uh, I don't know if in your mind equity includes um, participation, broad participation, but I would include that as well. Yes. Yeah. I just two, two um, standards. One, yeah. yeah. Or, or both. Okay. That's what I'm yep. Saying. So I, we look this over in mm -hmm. personnel, or you want to do it in. We'll probably go back to personnel, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. So now our vote is to. Oh, you got to edit that. All right. Pat, you're leaving, and Stephanie's getting very quick. You knew that. Okay, so okay. I'm sorry. Who motioned that? Michelle motioned. Daphne, Daphne second. second. Okay. I think I'm changing this. Michelle, I'm going to have to take some frustrated. It's funny because you were so frustrated. So the, the correct vote is, to table is, is yes. abstain or y yes? No, I changed it. It says to, um, it, it, yeah, it was, it's table. Okay. Yeah, I changed it in the... Okay. Um, so if you want to table so it, you should vote yes. 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 We table it. Okay. Okay. Yep. In order to table it. Yes. Yeah, in spite of what it says. You got to <coughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, if it passes, we can always just move to repass it. So. I'll vouch for you, Steve. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. It should say the table. It says the board adopts. You can. Adopt, uh, you can Oh, I didn't put it in that side. Maybe we're... Yeah. The action. Saying Greg can see. Okay. Getting punchy here. Okay. Okay, so now we're on to K3. Motion and a second for K3, the school improvement panels. Michelle, second. Greg. And I think we sent this back once. My only mm -hmm. comment on that is that in the future, we should just make sure that those move around a little bit. I mean, I see a lot of the usual suspects on some of these, even now, on some of these lists, and, you know, maybe we can broaden that to include <laughs> different, different people next year. Maybe you felt like that. I don't think so. Not a school improvement. Yeah. Yeah. That was fun. I think I'll get it. Hmm. I can't.
can mark your, your vote. I, I vote yes, but I don't see it here. Nope, I don't see it. Maybe we can get you into a computer science course. Yeah, right. yeah. If you look behind yourself, you'll see that you do. Okay, so we're all good. Okay, so let's move on. Um, next, I think item L is all consent. Is there any, um, any questions? We don't need a motion for this because we're going to do a consent motion at the end. Any questions or comments on item L, on items on item L of the agenda? Um, hearing none, any questions on item M of the agenda? Okay. Um, moving on then uh, to item N. Any questions on uh, items that are under N? I do. I just have a quick related question. Bill, Bill actually mentioned it, but I was wondering it earlier. Do we ever do an audit of who takes our buses? And I know we can't run... Um, you know, condensed routes, but do we ever sort of reach out to parents? Because we are all in power school. I know um, Donna reached out to parents to tell everyone the bus stop via power school. So I just wonder, it might be really interesting to, to do a quick sampling of parents who are on the bus route. Does your child take the bus? How often? Why not? I don't know. If we ever reach out to ask. Some cost savings there. If if buses are running at a low capacity because people just get a ride and yeah I don't, I don't know how that's addressed but and also could a parent decline a bus but and okay so we can't fill the spot even if a parent declines oh. no. okay. see again okay. it's not as simple as it's that. not as simple yeah. as that yeah, yeah. okay thanks okay. I do know that I've heard from people that Kids are taking less buses because the routes have gotten so much longer. And also, the other way, leaving JW, parents are doing a lot more pickup because they don't want their kids sitting on the bus. I mean, in, in case they have some other activity. I mean, it's just a fact with the things, the way things are. Well, right. when, you, when you're when tiering buses, yeah. that's, that's right. what happens. You're no, no, the I know. bus over and over right. again, so. And we have to. Yeah. I mean, we, we have, have to. to. I just have heard, I've heard these things in the grocery store. Mm -hmm. In the produce. In the produce in the section. section. <laughs> okay, so that gets us to item O, which is that we need a motion for all the consent items that we just mentioned. So we can have a motion for item O, Beth, and a second, Daphna. And now we have one vote on all of that. I vote yes. <laughs> okay, so are we all set? Then, um, okay, thank you. Okay, before we adjourn, any questions or comments from the public left? Mary Clerman? And Michelle's concern about uh, ability to speak up with their own opinions. I've been looking at the New Jersey School Board Association rules, and what I discovered, what I realized, is that every one of them has a balance in it. So there's a discretionary factor. They say, on the one hand, you should do this, but on the other hand, you must also do that. So you must be responsible to the board, but you're also responsible to the community, vice versa. So I just think that what the bottom line is that you can't write everything into policy but that when you have a parent who complains about the lighting or about the whatever, the noise, the alarm, the, the first time the parent complains, you can say whatever you all have talked about, which is very good, but to follow up on it later and say, did anybody do anything? Did you get anywhere with that? Would give the human aspect of it that, that seems to be missing when you otherwise say, did you talk to so-and-so? Because the policy, the policy that says you have to do, go to this person and then to, if that fails, go to the next person, if that fails, go to the next person, is exhausting for people who are working and not necessarily able to follow through on it. But if you then say, uh, you know, something to help them on, on, the, on the way, I think it would be a big help. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sure. I just, want, I just want to say that 
just want to make two quick comments. First one is, from where I sit there, we cannot see the board. Uh, that's number one. With the, that's a lighting problem. The other one is that I am kind of <laughs> looking at this and I say, gee whiz, if instead of having everybody look at his computer and looking around where he's going to push the button, you just say, all those in favor raise their <laughs> hand, it will be over in one-tenth of the time that it takes you with a computer to do the same thing. From your mouth that's to God's a, ears, that's just a comment. Mr. Perry, that's, that's my, I'm, I'm with you on that, that one. That, that's but, just a comment. Yes. Uh, the other one, I want to make a comment on what Greg said uh, with the question of uh, what you can say and what you cannot say as member of the board. Uh, I haven't heard one word that you said that the public elected you and that you have a responsibility to the public as much as you have a responsibility to the school, uh, in, in a way you have to protect the public in, a, in, in some ways, and that doesn't say there. And this is, this is this whole thing that we suddenly had a clash in town because of the referendum, because nobody was looking for the public. We can we can discuss that. Except for you. I'm, I'm, Thanks. We I'm were sorry. we were all I looking out for the public. No. Oh, I, I, I'll just have to say we, we were all looking out for the public, not just Michelle. President, if you if you uh, would like to ask um, Gabe what we're doing, Gabe Shackney, what we're doing to improve the vision, if you could take a second. Okay, that would be helpful. Thanks, Gabe. Um, we actually investigated, we had a meeting with uh, a couple of different vendors for projectors, and we started looking at ones for here, and the new projector that we have ordered for here is roughly about five times as bright and probably will not have to turn out lights for presentations any further on, in this room, so it's going to be a brand new projector, hopefully in the next few weeks. Great, great. Thank, great. You. thank you. Just let me know. Thank you. And transferable, if ever the... Yes. Building. Absolutely. Great. Oh, wow. Building to be moved. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions or comments from the board before we close? If there are none, then you can have a motion to adjourn. Mm -hmm. Betsy in a second. Jess? Okay. That's easy. Okay. The meeting's adjourned. Two left.